when they can make you doubt yourself, doubt your reality, you are so much more malleable and controllable within the relationship. So this is why it's a clever manipulation technique. Mm. People would dismiss us, people would disrespect us, and it's said and done in ways that maybe we don't actually realize we're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the most common manipulation tactics that other people can use on us. And so today I wanna to dive deep on what the things that people say and then how do we respond when they're said to us. So the one that I wanna start with that you say is faux concern. Mm. So talk to me about faux concern and why this is such a powerful manipulation tactic and how we can recognize it. So fake concern or faux concern is used when, let's just say, you're in a situation and maybe you're complaining to your partner or even a friend or a sibling about something that they've done. And they go, babe, I'm, I'm really worried about you. I wasn't gonna say anything, but Bob, told me he's worried about you too. I feel like you're, something's going on with you. Are you okay? So I want us to see clearly what is happening there, which is that they are distracting you from what your, your complaint, your issue, maybe there was a violation that they did to you. And now they're using fake concern to basically tell you, not only did they think something's wrong with you, they also, now they brought in Bob. Bob also, I wasn't gonna say anything, but Bob also is concerned about you. So this is how it's manipulation and how you can spot it is when you start with a complaint or you start with you're making a request that they stop doing something or that you don't like that they did something and they move into this, I think you're crazy type of thing. I'm concerned about your mental wellness basically is what is going on. So what do you do if you're in that situation? Right? How That's, do you decipher that it's faux versus actually real? Well, if you're not making a complaint to them about something, if you're not bringing up a concern and your partner out of nowhere says, hey, babe, you seem exhausted, I'm concerned about you. That's probably legit, right? It's as a reaction or in response to you saying something to them that they don't like. You saying something to them that they want to divert attention away from, and they want to now, they're putting the attention on you. I'm worried about you. So, and they do it in a way because it's hard, when you just look at it on the surface, it's hard to be mad that someone is worried about you. So this is why it's a clever manipulation technique, mm. right? Because if you say something, the person could say, oh, now I'm not allowed to be worried about you. The thing is, <laughs> they're not worried about you. They are manipulating you, which is different. So that's how you can make the distinction, mm. is if they're basically derailing the conversation that you started to them being worried about you. So that, that's how you can sort of see it. Now, what do we do? Well, part of it is you can say, hey, I appreciate your concern. And I would like to, before we get into that, go back to the origin of this conversation where I was making a simple request that you not make plans with other people without talking to me first, because now we're double committed on Wednesday. That's so freaking powerful. Okay, in those situations, like let's say that's a partner, you can do something like that. What if it's somebody that maybe you're not as close to? Because I definitely think there's different situations where I, I and maybe people listening, I'd be more comfortable to address something when it's a partner, right? To say, well, like, hang on a minute. Actually, I want to go back to here. But sometimes when it's either a stranger or even just an acquaintance, mm -hmm. um, I think I would be more reluctant to being open like that. And Yes, no, that's a really good point because there's different scenarios where this manipulation technique can come in and, and where it's um, subtext for something else. So let's say I had a client who left a very religious, it really was very cult-like, and she would bump into these people in her community 
and they would be like, we're all praying for you. We're worried about you, which of course the subtext is you're on the wrong path, you're going to hell, your eternal damnation is now yours. And so we came up with a way for her to respond rather than taking the bait, because she knows what they're saying in a passive aggressive way, trying to manipulate her, scare her into coming back. But instead, she was very sure that it wasn't right for her. We had already worked all that through. So instead, she would say, thank you so much. We could all use more prayers. I'm praying for you guys too. Dude, it's so strong. Okay, so what does that actually do then? Take me through, because as, as you said, I was like, oh my God, that feels so good. So what is that actually doing? Is that I'm standing my ground, I'm not taking the bait like mm -hmm. you said, and I'm giving you almost a way that you can't rebut, like there's no way that they can almost come back at that. Is that right. the strategy? Well, you take the power away by not taking the bait, because here's the thing, when we take the bait, we are colluding with the manipulation. Mm. When we take the bait, we're now a part of the manipulation dynamic. So part of being unmanipulatable to the best of our ability is that we are not super provocable by other people, especially if you have people in your family or extended family or even friend group who are manipulative, who try to manipulate you and or who unconsciously because here's the thing, people always have a tendency to think that manipulation is always like a nefarious, like, mm, I got a secret plan to manipulate you. It's not always that. Because some people, if you don't have the ability to talk true, as I would call it, to be direct about things, it could be very threatening for people to be direct. Mm -hmm. So there's other ways that are socially acceptable ways that manipulation is used. So, for example, you may have a friend who complains all the time. You may have a partner who complains all the time. This can be a form of manipulation, especially if you're a codependent, if their complaint makes you want to fix what they're complaining about, makes you want to offer to help, makes you want to make them see a different way. It's not that bad. You know, maybe, and again, now that's a particular one that people could really be doing that unconsciously because it can be learned behavior. It can just be a habit. It almost is like we get lazy and just focus on the bad, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take like a lot of effort it's because of our negativity bias as human beings, right? We remember the bad stuff five times more readily mm -hmm. than the good stuff. So it doesn't take a lot of effort. It's not very creative to complain all the time. Like, it, it doesn't take a genius to point out what's wrong in the world and in our lives. It, it's more challenging and, of course, better for our mental wellness if we're able to see it with more balance. Also point out the good. I don't mean hyper-positivity. I mean, take responsibility. Oprah says you have to take responsibility for the energy that you bring into a room and the energy that you leave in a room. Mm. And, you know, there's all of these, you know, side note, there's all these studies that are done about how damaging being around a chronic complainer is, how bad it is for you, mental health-wise. But there was a study done, and I'll find it, and I'll, I'll send it to you, about being around a chronic complainer as little as 30 minutes a day negatively impact the other people's IQ. Their IQ? Their IQ. Whoa, I didn't expect you to say that. Yeah, like it's bad for your brain. It's bad oh. for your mental health. Not to mention, it's so hard to be around, especially if you lean towards codependency. Right, that's literally what I was gonna say, because if you're in a relationship where you have someone that's maybe toxic, if you're a, someone who's codependent and an empath, those two together, I can see fueling each other and being more difficult to separate because actually the codependent person is getting almost what they need, even though it's not healthy for them. Yep. And, and here's the thing. Instead of toxic, we'll say unhealthy. Okay. Because here's the thing. I feel like with, with the, the term toxic, it's used and misused a lot. And, and it's such an extreme word. We're really talking about unhealthy behavior, mm. right? Like the person may, may be their chronic complainer and yet 
they're like the greatest friend ever or they're something else. So mm. it, I feel like it's too broad a stroke. So we're just going to say unhealthy for our purposes with what Love we're talking that. about now. Yeah. Um, so complaining, though, really can be a way to get you to do something, a way to, because what is manipulation, right? When we think about manipulation, it is someone else asserting their um, power or ability, doing their best to get you to do what they want you to do, which may be different than what you want to do. So, right, you want to have a conversation, what we started off with at the top, you want to have a conversation, you, you're confronting them about something, and they use the faux concern to get you off beat. Mm -hmm. We talked about the one who left the church. You run into those people, what do they want to do? They want to scare the crap out of you with their, their fake concern. You know, and maybe in their heart of hearts, they think it's real, but it's still a manipulation technique mm -hmm. because they're trying to get you to get right on the righteous path again, right? So what are other ones that we see sort of readily. I mean, listen, if someone is, now we might be able to say toxic here, and really a manipulator, they could straight up lie as a manipulation tactic to get you what they want you to do. Just straight up lie. And if anyone has been in a relationship with a narcissist or has been raised by one or has had any dealings with one, knows that really the, the ends justifies the means in their mind and they will have selective memory about a conversation that you had about i thought that we were going to talk about the vacation days before you committed to your family no i didn't say that we agreed that and literally i, I will have therapy clients coming in and being like i can't tell what's real i could swear we had the like i feel like i have to record our conversations because we remember them so differently. And that, that is lying, but it's also straight up gaslighting, which is another really big manipulation technique that we hear a lot about online. Yeah. Right, people are talking about gaslighting. So, so what is that, let's establish it, and I'm sure you've talked about it on the show before, but we'll do it anyway, is where someone basically is denying your reality. They're wanting to shake the foundation of your um, reality, of your belief in yourself, your belief in what you heard, your belief in what happened. So why, why do they do this? Because when you're unstable, when you're off your game, when they can make you doubt yourself, doubt your reality, you are so much more malleable and controllable within the relationship. Mm -hmm. And they'll remind you do you remember when you thought we had that conversation, but we didn't? That is concerning to me. So even more, they're, they're getting their hooks into controlling you and what goes on. So with gaslighting, you have to be really mindful of the conversations that you have. You have to write them down. I love to put things in writing with people like that, mm -hmm. where I'm like, as per our conversation on Wednesday the 4th, especially if it's business stuff where people, I feel like they're, they will have selective memory to their benefit and to my detriment. <laughs> I'm always like, hey, and here's a recap yeah. of what we agreed to. And with people like that, of course, if it's business, <laughs> I have a rock solid contract as well mm -hmm. because you, it, you can really get in trouble if you go into business with people like this, especially if you're a trusting soul. And I think one of the things that we can't possibly have this conversation without adding in is that when you're um, an empath, when you're a good person, when you're a kind person, when you're not a manipulative person by nature, we have a tendency to assume that other people are like us. It's called positive projection, where we actually project our own positive qualities onto other people, although we don't have evidence yet that those people actually possess those qualities. Mm -hmm. So I always say to my therapy clients, you know, let's wait and see. Let's slowly develop these relationships. And the more evidence we get that this person is emotionally trustworthy, that's what we're gonna go on. We're not gonna go on how we wish they were, how we pray they are, how we hope they are. And I'm not saying be a total paranoid basket case either, but there is something about 
having the patience to let the proof be in people's behaviors and not just their words. Because when you're a trusting soul, it's really easy to just go, well, they're like me. And I always say to my clients, babe, they're not like you. Mm -hmm. Like, or we don't know yet. So let's just take our time as we develop relationships because people will start revealing. Even with these manipulation techniques that we're talking about, people will start revealing who they are. And here's what I say about red flags. We must take notice. Every person watching this, listening to this, if you've been in a bad relationship, oh dude, there were so many red flags that you were like, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too tough. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. Maybe they didn't mean it. Maybe they had a bad day. I want every person watching and listening to get committed to trusting your gut. If someone says something to you and your gut goes in a knot, I want you to write down why. Do not just slough it under the rug. Allow, allow yourself to protect yourself. Your gut instinct is amazing. Mm -hmm. And well, a lot of us have been talked out of it, you know? I love that. And the, the writing down of the gut, I actually have started to do because I think of it as it being a skill that I'm trying to cultivate and to, trying to get stronger. And so I think that the gut instinct has come from so many years, right, from childhood of you saw someone look at you that way and then they actually got mad at you. So now you associate that look with mad, right? So like, yeah. I think that there's, there's so many things that we've, um, that our intuition has developed from childhood. So now I almost like go, okay, how do I improve it? How do I get my gut instinct to be even stronger? So yes. taking inventory is amazing. And then to your point, I've started to become somewhat of a flag conductor. So mm -hmm. I almost like don't just put up red flags. It's like, oh, that was actually a really nice thing they did. Green flag. Yes. Right? Oh, that's a, maybe a little concerning, but ba maybe it's just me because actually I'm in a bad mood right now. Orange flag. Yeah. And so now to your point of if you can get inventory on everyone you meet, the people you come into communication with, over time, you start to see, hang on a minute, 90% of this is red flags. That tells you something. Yes. Um, I think that is so damn powerful. And I really want to make sure that we, we go deep actually on the projection thing because this was super fascinating. So the, the positive projection can set us up for maybe failure or some mm -hmm. detriment because I understand that because we really want people to do well. But I've also heard you talk about that projection from somebody else can be a manipulation tool. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about how someone else can project their feelings onto you to make you maybe feel like you're being gaslit or maybe making yourself doubt yourself. And then I'd love to kind of yes. piece that apart. Well, part of it is we all, we all come from our own, you know, as Don Miguel Ruiz would say in the four agreements, right? We're all coming from our own nightmare, right? Even though that's not exactly what he says, but that's my interpretation <laughs> of one of those things, which is that we have our lived experience that informs our future experiences. Now, our awareness is the thing that can help us become a good flag conductor, right? I'm aware, oh, I had an unavailable, an emotionally unavailable father in childhood. How has that impacted my romantic relationships, my friend, all of it. It has now, of course, a bunch of therapy helps it affect it less. I'm aware mm. of like, when I was younger, I went after unavailable people emotionally. Then when I got hip to that in therapy, I stopped dating unavailable men emotionally, but I started dating them. They were all people who lived in Europe. And my, my therapist was like, Terry, dude, <laughs> They're literally <laughs> on other continents. They are still right. unavailable. And I was like, wow, this repetition, this compulsion to repeat what is familiar mm. is really strong. Because she's like, the, here's, here's the thing, is that you're still left in a state of longing. And I was like, oh, you're right. I'm counting the days till I can see, you're right. That's exactly mm. correct. Anyway, I figured that out through, through more therapy. But back to what you're saying, people can project onto you. And a really, um, let's say a common example of that is if you're dating someone who has had infidelity in their past, meaning someone cheated on them or multiple people cheated on them, and perhaps their parents had infidelity in their marriage, and then they're very jealous and paranoid and they wanna look through their, their your phone and they are negatively projecting 
their past experiences onto you. Mm. And acting like you're guilty because you have a guy friend, because you wore those low-waisted jeans, whatever, whatever the thing is, like stuff that has nothing to do with being faithful or not being faithful. And so, and we can all do that in relationships. This is why therapy and mental wellness and being aware of who you are and what you've experienced in your lived experiences and your family, right? Your family of origin experience. All of these things create this unconscious blueprint about how the world is, about how love is, about how boundaries should be, about money, about success, about everything. And so part of the beautiful process of therapy, at least the way that I do it with people and what I write in my books and what I share online, is that we're basically taking a walk into the basement and like opening up some dusty boxes to understand why do I relate this way? So if the person who was cheated on would go into their basement and would be like, why am I so paranoid? If I were being in the here and now, I would ask myself, does my partner, is there anything that they've done to indicate that they are unfaithful or that they will be unfaithful? And most likely the answer would be no, right? If you have not done anything, they could go from that place. They could have a conversation with you and be like, babe, I know I'm a little paranoid about needing to know where you are. And I have to say, I know it's me. I know it's from my past. So please bear with me. I'm working on it, right? We can talk about these things instead of acting them out because as people, those are basically our two choices. We're either gonna talk it out because now it's from the basement to the main part of the house. Now we have the opportunity to go, hmm, let me dive into this and try to understand why the heck I'm like this. Or we act it out. Because those unresolved feelings, the pain that someone who was cheated on or the parents who cheated, that pain is driving and informing that person's paranoid behavior. Mm -hmm. What up homies, it's Lisa Bilyeu and I want to tell you about the easiest way to listen to my podcast, Women of Impact. If you're anything like me, time is so freaking precious. It's the thing you're never going to get back. So how on earth do you make the most of it and look for ways to make your life way easier and simpler? And so that's where Amazon Music comes in because listening to Women of Impact on Amazon Music is about as easy as it gets. You can listen on the app, which is super freaking easy to navigate, or you can just ask my homie Alexa. Alexa, play Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Now playing Women of Impact on Amazon Music. See, it's that simple. And let me tell you, the content is freaking fire. If you're ready, my homie, to be a freaking badass, then listen and follow Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Right, because for them, you're like, it's not paranoid. My parents had it, and I've had it in my past. <laughs> right. This is what happened. Love, people who, who love each other cheat on each other. That's their downloaded love blueprint. So it's our job to bring that up and understand it. Anyway, that was the longest way around the barn. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so here's the thing, and exactly what you said. I think this is super powerful because so the, having that communication can be amazing if that person's willing to do it. Yep. So now I go to, if I'm the person who's, let's say my boyfriend or my partner or whoever is saying, hey, that's too sexy, that's too raunchy, you're showing your belly. Um, I've got almost two options, right? Mm -hmm. I can go, oh, he's got trauma from the past. His partner used that as a manipulation tool to get guys um, attention. So I actually understand why he feels that me showing my belly is too revealing, even though I don't agree. So now I don't show my belly. Mm -hmm. And then the next time it's like, actually, you know, I don't like it when you text so-and-so. So now I go, oh, but I understand because of where it comes from, their partner text a guy and that was the guy that they end up having the affair with. Yep. So now what I do is I start to maneuver and change my behavior because I want to communicate with my partner, because I want to show them respect. But over time, I slowly, slowly stop being the person I want to be. Yep. I would definitely be thumbs down on um, colluding with those limiting beliefs, those unresolved injuries right? Because that's basically what we're doing. We can have an understanding, right? If you have an understanding and you can say to your partner, listen, I understand that. And yet the, you're in a relationship with me and this is who I am. Mm. 
and this is how I express myself. And I don't know if this is a deal breaker for us. We can talk about it, but I don't want to start cutting off parts of myself to appease your wounds. You're bleeding all over me, but I didn't cut you. Right? Yeah. And maybe there's conflict, but at least that's honest. That at least you're standing true in, I love you. I'm mm -hmm. not being unfaithful to you. Mm -hmm. And me expressing myself through my fashion, having a, a, a guy who's a friend, that's my right as a human. And this is, I need to be fully self-expressed if I'm gonna be my actual authentic self with you. And it bums me out that you want me to be smaller. And I don't want to be. And actually, I'm not willing to be. But I am willing to talk. And I am willing to get into therapy with you. And I am willing to do plenty of things. You know, I mean, listen. If, if, if your partner says, I don't want you being best friends with your ex-husband. Like, best friends. To, having plans alone. Having, like, Wednesday night dinner with just your ex-husband. Like, there, there are nuances Why? in these scenarios. But the one we're talking about is not that. We're saying having, having a friend who's literally just a friend, dressing the way that you want that would be fully self-expressed, and it threatening your partner. And you do have choices. So sometimes we compromise, right? But the type of compromising that you were saying and that you were saying kind of makes you too small mm -hmm. is something where we're chipping away at our authentic self. And the end of that, that's like a one-way ticket to bitter land. Because sooner or later, all of those considerations, all of that paranoia, all of the walking on eggshells, I don't want to set this person off around this, around that, around this, around that. Dude, no. It's no way to live. Think about, anybody watching, listening, think about how much in your life right now you're walking on eggshells. That situation needs your attention. Because I promise you, it is no way to live because what happens is when we're always anticipating someone getting mad or being upset, we are so second guessing ourselves. We're so self-conscious about our thoughts, about our next move. It's like, how can we be liberated to be the beautiful, unique expressions mm -hmm. of ourselves if we're second guessing every move? Yeah, God, it's so tough. Like when I was younger, my first boyfriend um, before I met Tom was verbally abusive to me. Mm. And he was jealous all the time. And I remember there being moments where I would have something sexy on and I wouldn't know what response I would get. I wouldn't know if he'd be like, oh my God, you look so hot today. Or if he'd fly off the handle and be like, you can't fucking wear that because other guys are going to look. I didn't know what I was going to get. And so to your point of walking on eggshells um, was such a uh, uncomfortable place to be. But I think it came from, I got tremendous validation from him when he said, oh my God, you look so hot. And so I obviously got tremendous emotional punishment if it was he was in the other mood and he was like, you look like a slut. He would say things like that, like yep. you can't go out like that. Yep. Um, and so, but because I was so insecure, I wouldn't leave because the moments that he gave me the validation were just enough yep. to keep me to stay. Mm. Speaking of manipulation tactics, <laughs> In the world, mm -hmm. and in the dating world, and in the world of romance, kind of what you're describing is breadcrumbing, mm -hmm. right? Where someone gives you just enough to stay, just enough to be like, oh, I'm, I'm seeking that high of their approval, and now I got a little bit, especially in the dating world, it's actually very, this is a manipulation technique that is used all the time, mm -hmm. which is someone pops in with a flirty text and it's like, hey, been thinking about you. And you're like, oh my gosh, we should meet up. Radio silence. They just wanted to know that you would still react, respond, want to see them. It's very unlikely you're meeting up with that person. Mm. Right? The breadcrumbing is fascinating. I was about to ask you how you know if it's a breadcrumb or a loaf. Like, <laughs> like how 
<laughs> you know, if it's just like the trickle or they're actually serious. Yeah. Um, the disappearing actually is that's fascinating on just like them just testing to see if you're still available. And, and responding in this very selective way. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, hey, do you want to meet up on Friday? Um, also, I saw Bob from accounting or whatever. They'll, they'll say something like, oh my God, I saw Bob from accounting too, two weeks ago. That's so weird. And say nothing about the, do you want to meet up? Mm -hmm. So they're responding to you technically, but they're, that omission is so, tells you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. So let's break it down. How do we know? if it's the crumbs or the loaf. Again, here's where we're gonna be collecting the red flags, where if someone's behavior is erratic, if you can't count on it, if they pop back up, there's also a thing called paper clipping, Ooh. where I know, who knows, I, I just did a show on dating somewhere, so I, <laughs> like, I have all these terms, but paper clipping is where someone is, you haven't heard from them at all, they just pop back up as if nothing has happened, and then disappear again. So it's, it's actually similar to breadcrumbing, but breadcrumbing, there seems to be more, con there seems to be more mm -hmm. contact. It's sporadic, and it's very specific and pointed. So they're not making plans with you. That's what's happening with breadcrumbing. Mm -hmm. And even if they do, they'll flake, they won't show up, they'll ghost, they'll, they'll cancel the last minute. So what you're looking for is consistency so if, if we're looking for relationships with people who are sincere, right? I mean, listen, not, not everyone's looking for that. But if you are looking for something, it's so important to pay attention to someone's behavior. Because words are so cheap. They're like a dime a dozen. Anyone can say anything. What I want to know, and I would always say this to my clients when they're like, oh my gosh, he said we should go to the south of France and we should do this. And I'm like, that's lovely. What did he do? When he said he was gonna call you on Friday, did he call? No, he didn't call. Okay, so can we write that down? Can we be aware? Did you say anything to him about not calling? No, because I don't wanna seem like a nag and I don't wanna be, I don't even know him. Do you wanna to get to know him? If the rest of your life is gonna be someone saying shit and not keeping their word, do you want to get to know them? Like how about let's not be so afraid of rejection that our bar is so low. Yeah for other people's behavior, which is why it's so important that we really get that how we treat ourselves, that's the thing that sets the bar for every other relationship in your life. So if you're last on your own list, if you treat yourself like crap, if you talk about yourself badly, if you put up with crap behavior from other people, you will inevitably attract folks who agree with your low self-esteem. Mm. Right, so that's the first place when people are in my courses, when um, you know, people get into therapy with me, that's the first place is if they've got relationships that are problematic, that are creating pain for them, we always dive first into, okay, what do you really feel about yourself? Do you high, hold yourself in high esteem? Do you think you're valuable inherently? Like, you don't have to throw a parade or like light yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Like, do you believe that you have inherent worth simply by virtue of being alive? And if the answer to that is no, that's where we start mm. the work. Because that changes everything. When, when our self-care, self-love, we hold ourselves in high regard, it changes your entire world because you don't put up with crap behavior from other people. And I know we're on the same page here of mm -hmm. not putting up with bad behavior from others, but we realize that we have a choice. We can opt out. And I'm not talking about people in severely abusive relationships and I'm not minimizing that because mm -hmm. that shit is not simple yeah. and you can't and it could be dangerous to just opt out. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having friends who treat you badly. We're talking about being in a relationship where you do all the work where you're doing all the emotional labor, mm -hmm. where your partner is like, you can take care of the house, the kids and everything. And I'm, it's really about me and my quality time with my friends. I have a friend who has a husband who, you know, she just does literally everything. And her whole life is built around making sure he gets enough rest, making sure he gets to do the things he likes to do, not caring that he goes on vacation with his friends and she's left home with three kids. Like, 
where I'm like, what happened? And she's so amazing that I want to be like, why? She knows I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like him. Why does he treat her like that? But why does she put up with it It is is the better question. And of course, lovingly, I've lovingly told her my concerns over the years. And, you know, all we can do is that, right? When when it's other people, all we can do is share our concern. Yeah, and... That's it's very hard when it's somebody else, right? Especially if you're a therapist, I'm sure you've got so much advice and you're just like, that's her side of the street. I, I love your analogy, which by the way, I use it all the freaking time, side of the street to myself as well. Same. I go to like tell someone something and I'm like, nope, Lisa, it's not your side of the street. So that analogy in our last episode for anyone at home, go watch it. It changed my life on how I think about boundaries and like, okay, is this me or is this their side of the street? such a beautiful way of thinking about things. I literally say it out loud to people now. So <laughs> I, I, I really do use it. Um, but even thinking through everything that we're talking about, I know that you talk about manipulation tactics that people can use that um, I think really embeds in someone who's a people pleaser and someone that identifies themselves as an empath or really wants to help other people is the guilt trip. Mm. And people, I think there are... Again, I want to be careful when I say manipulation because to your point, some people use it deliberately and some people don't use it deliberately. It's still manipulation either way though. Okay. Right. So we, we it's intentional. Perfect. Or unconscious. Perfect. Either one of those, people do guilt trip you. Yes. So I'd actually love to hear scenarios of how we would address if it's someone that's deliberately trying to guilt trip you in order to deliberately manipulate you to do something you naturally yep. wouldn't do. How would I address that? And then someone who doesn't mean to manipulate you, um, but they're still using the guilt treatment as a means to get you to do something. Yep. So guilt, shame, blame. These are, this is like the trifecta of manipulation, especially if you're an empath. Mm because we feel it so deeply, because we don't want anyone to be mad, because we don't want, oh my God, someone being disappointed with us, you're like, ah. Yeah, the disappointed person, that's the worst. Just the worst, (laughs) we want to do anything to avoid that. And yet we have to learn to tolerate our feelings and to get really clear. As you're healing, as empaths, someone being upset can be enough to make us just abandon ourselves and go, okay, fine, all right, it's, it's not a big deal. Like, we don't have to make a big deal about it. I'll, I'll do the thing, right? So I want you to be aware if you're someone who is like quick to self-abandon in those times. Mm-hmm. And you also, let's get clear about who are the guilt trippers in our lives. Because trust me, you know, I know, everybody listening knows, we know. A lot of times it's mothers, a lot of times it's old school, a lot of times there's a cultural element Mm. to it. But we still have the opportunity to not let it work. So there's a couple of things that you can say to someone. And and I feel like this is appropriate, whether we feel like it's intentional or unintentional. If someone's like, um, well, you told me that you love that car. And so... I bought that car. Now I hate that car. So I don't know why you told me to buy it. You'd be like, hey, Bob, you bought that car of your own volition, your own accord. I did not. I got nothing out of you buying that car. So I'm I'm actually not taking this on. But I'm sorry that you're bummed out. But the words are, I'm not taking this on or I'm not taking responsibility for your choice. Right? Or someone who makes you feel bad that you have what they want. So let's say someone who gets engaged to be married and they're so excited. They're, they're, they've, yeah, yeah, I got engaged. And you have a friend who's like, good for you. Too bad it's never going to be me. <laughs> right? Friend. And there are people like that who you know the friend who, like, legit can't be happy for you. They can't. Everything good that happens to you is like something bad happening to them. That's an unhealthy friend. But I feel like every person in the world has had at least one of them. Mm -hmm. If someone were to say that, you could say, hey, what I would love is if you could just be happy for me right now. Right now, my engagement is about me. And do you actually advise to ask that as someone, even if you can predict that they're not going to be happy? 
Because my instinct is to go, oh, they're never going to be happy. If I say this out loud, they're just going to dismiss it. And now I actually feel worse about myself. So in this situation, maybe depending on the person, I wouldn't say it. It depends on how close you are. Yeah. Because if it's someone who you want to have a close relationship mm. with, then I would say to them, not, not in a moment of great joy, of my own great joy, mm. but I would at a different moment, maybe we're out to lunch. I have to be honest with you. I hesitate to tell you good things that happen in my life because a lot of times your response is that you're sad it's not you. So I feel like it can never really be about me and it bums me out. I feel like it's coming between us. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you'd be willing to work on that or think about that. Now, will they be mad? Will they be like, oh my God, I can't do anything right or whatever. Who knows what, people can be defensive and you can say, I see that you're feeling defensive about this, I understand. And yet, this was a hard conversation for me to initiate with you. And I did it because I love you. And it would have been so much easier to not, which is what I've been doing. But I feel like if I keep not having the real conversation with you, I'm not gonna wanna be friends. Isn't one of your quotes something like, um, if you have something to say, by not saying it, it's a lie? Like omission. Yes. Yes. That, I mean, listen, omission is a kind of a lie, you know? And, and when I say omission, I don't mean if your girlfriend, your friend, your pal gets a bad haircut, right? <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, Just be like, that looks fucking ugly. Yes, that's <laughs> awful. So I don't believe in like brutal honesty. Right, thank unless you my that. friend yeah. says, honestly, what do you think? You know what? Honestly, you're beautiful either way. I like it a little longer better. There's a way that we can be kind. I'm not saying you have to lie, but when we're talking about omission, we're talking about omitting important things, right? Omitting things that actually change. You know, if someone has a child with someone else and you think that they're in a monogamous relationship with you and they have children with you, them not telling you, that's a big omission, which is a lie, right? Meaning you built your relationship mm. on a lie, yeah. you know? so. I think that in being able to have the conversation, even though it's hard, and some people can tolerate it, and some people can't, but again, how they receive it is not your side of the street. Your side of the street is being healthy enough and loving yourself enough to be like, I don't wanna be in a relationship with this friend who I can never tell them the good things that happen in my life because they're actually jealous of every good thing. That's like a selfish person. And maybe they could step it up and be less selfish. And maybe they literally are clueless about how the way they are is impacting and hurting you. And so it is so loving to be honest in that way, even though they may not feel it in the moment, they may not feel like it's being, it's so loving. But the truth is it is, because it's so much easier just to ghost people, just to be monumentally busy, just to like never make plans with that person anymore. But maybe there's something valuable in that friendship for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I promise you, asserting yourself, asserting your truth, unless the person is actually toxic, unless they can never hear it, unless we know that they're a narcissist, right? We don't want to make, speaking of manipulation, if we have evidence, that the person we're talking about has no capacity for self-reflection, no interest in taking responsibility for what is their side of the street. That is someone who in my book is truly toxic. Mm -hmm. So I do not want people making themselves vulnerable to that type of manipula manipulative personality because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm because the more that person knows about you, the more they're gonna use it against you. So we're really talking about two kinds of relationships. The ones where there's hope, where we can work something out, and in all of those relationships, there's manipulation or attempts to manipulate, even in healthy relationships, right? But, it, but if I'm negotiating with my husband, I'm doing it honestly. So that's not manipulation. I'm trying to persuade him. He wants to have this for dinner. I'm like, please, I really want pizza. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. You said last week we get a pizza. Like, that's not the same as manipulation. That's honest negotiation, mm. which is different 
because our cards are on the table. He's trying to get his need met. I'm trying to get my need met. That's life. That's a long-term relationship. You need to be able to do that. But the difference is that with manipulation, we are hiding our true motive under guilt, shame, blame, fake concern, lying, love bombing, um, gaslighting, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things. Dude, that was so freaking strong because as you were talking, I was like, look, a lot, some of the stuff we're going over, I've done to other people before, not meaning it to be a form of bad manipulation. Yeah. And so even with talking about everything, I'm like, oh, wow, I've actually said that to someone before. Why did I say it like that? Was I trying to manipulate them? And it was like, oh, maybe I was trying to manipulate them, not in an evil way. Right. So I'm like processing everything in my head and then going, but I don't feel like I'm a toxic person. So thank you. That was literally going to be my question of like, how do you start to decipher what is a learned behavior that maybe you've seen from your siblings, your parents? And so you just mimic that behavior because you know it works. You don't think of it as being a manipulation tool. Yeah. But now with everything we're saying, I think the, the realities and revealing that is really strong. But then comparing that to someone that absolutely means it, is doing it to um, as a controlling mechanism, as a power play, as pulling the wool over your eyes, as being that controlling person. Yeah. So um, that differentiator makes all the sense. And I'm exactly with you. I openly, I like to say to my husband, I openly manipulate him. Like, that's just the words we use. But I'm like, I have no qualms. It's like, babe, if you do this, I'll, I'll give you some nookie. But like, right. it's like, joke, no joke. I think that that's healthy in a relationship in the sense if you can be transparent yes. and honest about it. Because I'm not shy about it. I'll be like, all right, babe, well, what do you want? Like, right. And it works for us. But there's no deceiving. Exactly. So it's not manipulation, right? If, if there's transparency, it's not manipulation. Right, right. I think that the, the pain points for so many of my clients around this is for themselves. Like if we're looking in, if we're doing self-reflection work around where are you? not being straight. Mm -hmm. Where are you trying to get a need met through passive aggressive means, through guilt, through manipulation? Because listen, none of us are perfect. And most of us have no model for being direct and asking for what you need and being straight, telling the truth. We really don't because it's considered in many cultures, being direct is considered rude, mm -hmm. right? It's considered being caustic or like too bossy or like too brazen well the brits exactly that oh my god the worst so bad i mean americans would be considered very direct mm -hmm. if we're looking at the cultures right That's, yeah cultures yeah. i mean except not in the south <laughs> so not in the south because in the south of the u.s they've gotten passive aggressive communication down to a science <laughs> really? yes if you want to say something bad about someone, if you want to say someone is a hot mess, mm -hmm. if you want to say they're like a stupid moron, you're like, bless his heart. <laughs> bless his heart is never about blessing anything. <laughs> People from the South, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know it. I do that as well, though. If I've got nothing nice to say, I'm like, bless. Like, yeah. it's just, it, it is a way to not be cruel or mean, but not be silent. I, I will actually say, bless and release oh. because that mm. feels good to me. Like mm. I don't have to have a bad feeling about this person. I don't like this thing I just heard about them or I don't agree with them, but I'm releasing it because it's not my side of the street and I don't need to agree with them, mm. right? They, they can just go. Mm. But for the rest of us, if you've got a parent, you're a grown adult and you've got a parent who guilts you, who's constantly giving you advice that you don't wanna take, who's constantly getting, trying to get you to do things you don't wanna do, take family vacations, come home and be home for Christmas for 10 days or whatever, whatever the thing is, you have to decide how you're going to handle that because that guilt can be very um, effective, <laughs> right? It, it can work. I never want, even now, I feel like my mother's pretty healthy, she's 85, but I don't want her to be disappointed in me. But I also realize a lot of times I'm, it's the little child in me. Like, it's not what my mother's doing now. Right. It's how I felt as a kid. And so I'll stop myself and say, this is ridiculous. You do not have to go above and beyond if, if whatever, I was traveling and she wanted to see me on a Sunday and I was going to get no sleep. It's okay 
to say no and give myself permission. A lot of times if I feel like I'm being quote unquote manipulated, even if I'm manipulating myself unconsciously, mm -hmm. I'll go, but I'll be resentful. Mm -hmm. Just checking a box, just getting it done. So I think with guilt, shame and blame, we just have to be really aware of who are the people in our lives who do that. And do we do that? Even with like germ blaming, you know, I, I, it's so funny. Like I have friends and I love them, but you know, they'll be like, I definitely got the cold from so-and-so's kid who was, <laughs> and I'm always like, why are you like tracking? It's like a storm tracker. You're tracking the germs where they came from. I have no freaking idea. The reason why I love it, I do that. I'm like, it was so and so, and they freaking sneeze, and then they touch the handle, and then I touch the freaking handle, and I'm like, and then literally I go into hyper, like, you're not allowed in the house for two weeks. Like, I do go extreme. Help me, help me, Terry. I don't know why. I just always felt before the pandemic, I was like, I really had low tolerance for my germ-phobic friends. Then the pandemic, of course, they got very validated in being germ-phobic. <laughs> Everyone was like, we're all germ-phobic now. What you got now, Terry? Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, you don't want to, am I still a germ tracker? I'm like, you are, but now I understand why it's a good reason to yeah. be. <laughs> but here's the thing. We have to understand the human element of why does it make us feel better yeah. to know? It's true. Because it's something we can't control even to the be even in, in our best efforts. And so we there is an illusion of control mm -hmm. if we track the germs. Wow. So we do everything we can control. We wash our hands, we use the, the stuff, we do all the things, mask up on a plane, whatever, even now, because there seems to be more of it coming out. Mm -hmm. And so there's an illusion of control. Yeah. Um, and so as we're talking about um, the, the control factor, um, the manipulation, I think, for me at least, is when I start to sense, is this a manipulation? Like that almost is worse for me than not realizing I'm being manipulated because it's the turmoil is like, so you, you were talking about it early and you alluded to it with the gaslighting, right? Where it's like, it makes you think like you're going freaking crazy. Yep. And that idea of, am I losing my mind? Have I imagined it? Like, puts you on your back hill, which then makes me feel out of control, which then makes me question everything. Yep. Here's the thing, though. If we start to identify with our red flags and doing our inventory, mm -hmm. you're going to see a pattern of who do I feel this way with? Who do I question my reality with? There will be a pattern because if someone is gaslighting you, it's going to be the same people who are the real manipulators in your life. So you can sort of soothe yourself by being like, here's the pattern. It is my mother-in-law. It is my, my mother, my Bobbin County, I don't know, whoever it is, that I have these experiences with where I always seem to somehow get what they said wrong. Why is it only with Bob and accounting mm -hmm. that I can't seem to get it together? and remember accurately what happened. So is that me? Or is that now I see a pattern because if it's not happening in other relationships. So part of it is we must be mindful. And it's important to have friends that you can talk to who you trust to say, remind me of this. I've had the same conversation with my mother-in-law four times where she tells me I agreed to do something and play games over a weekend with her friends that I swear to God I did not say I would do. And now she's holding me to it, but I didn't even agree to it. Remind me that this happened because I have this tendency to forget. I'm going to do it this time, but I'm not doing it next time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's really good if we can have an accountability buddy, especially if you feel like this is something that happens readily or regularly with certain people in your life. That is something to investigate. Yeah, because I think that that's so important to to actually say out loud. Thank you. In that, I don't just always want to assume it's the other person, right? right. Maybe it is something with me that I always have an issue with a guy in accounting. Yeah. And in fact, it wasn't there the story of one of your clients where they would keep complaining about all the female in in accounting or something, yep. um, and then you asked her the question, "Who does this remind you of?" Yes, and it was her bully sister. Yeah. So she was repeating that relationship 
And that was her side of the street. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's super powerful because I don't ever want to be like, oh, it's always them. I'm always asking myself, how is my involvement in this? Is there anything I could have done differently or better? And that isn't to beat myself up. That is always to try and improve. Yes. And so with that story with this female with where you asked her and she said, oh, with this, my bully sister, that's a great example of someone now that may go, oh, it's always this person that does this. They're manipulating me. They're always trying to trick mm. me. I've got my own back. But actually, maybe it's something that you've held on to that you haven't realized. Yes, but how you can realize it. Mm. So if you see this pattern, the pattern that you just described, you can ask yourself those three questions for clarity which will help you see if you're repeating something that's unresolved from your past. So who does this person remind me of? Where have I felt like this before? And how is this behavioral dynamic, the way we're interacting, how is that familiar to me? So those answers to those questions, you may find that you're blaming your boss for being like a judgmental cold jerk you may ask those questions, who does this person remind me of? And you'll be like, oh my God, reminds me of my judgmental cold father. Where have I felt like this before? All of my childhood. <laughs> How is this familiar to me? Me trying to get that person's approval, them withholding their approval. Why does it matter that we get those answers? So let's say you discover that you're repeating something from the past, an unresolved painful wound that you may have, what matters is there's also the adult you. When you reveal that, you're like, oh my gosh, my boss is not my father. I'm not 10. Wow, I was really having an amplified response to this person. But now that I have a choice, now that it's in my conscious mind, I'm going to remind myself that my boss is not my father. And I'm going to relate to my boss as the accomplished professional that I am, not seeking their approval, but seeking on my merit, right? I'm going to be doing well in this company because of what I contribute, not because I'm looking at them like my father. Mm -hmm. Now, that might sound convoluted. I hope that it was straightforward enough for people to get because it is so powerful when you use this tool of understanding where you're having what's called a transference, which means that you are in current day, in modern time, right now, in this present moment, you are reacting to a situation that is similar or reminds you of something that is unresolved from the past. That that impacts how you are in this present moment. So exactly like you shared about my client who always had a conflict with someone at work, we called it her work arch enemy, mm -hmm. And she was so convinced that it was them. And I'm not saying those people were not jerky. Maybe they were. I don't know. But all I know is that the way she was experiencing it was about an unresolved wound in her. Mm -hmm. When we ask these three questions, who does that arch enemy at work remind you of? Where have you felt like this before? How is it familiar? She was able to go, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. It is my sister. I'm relating to these people like they actually are my sister. I have no patience for them. I'm so frustrated. I see them as bullies. But are they? Or is it me? And once we resolved that original injury, what is so interesting is that all of that conflict just dissolved into the ether for mm -hmm. her. So there's power in knowing what we might be having an amplified response to because of something that needs our attention within us. I think, honestly, if I had to say, I think that's one of the biggest things that has happened to me um, in my growth and evolution over the last couple of years is identifying, honestly, my triggers, where they come from, and then owning them. Like, I used to put my triggers on my husband. Oh, yeah. Like, like babe, that isn't very nice. You, you, that is, you, you were just mean to me, right? Like, very much projecting on the things that he would say. And then once I started to do the deep dive and go, oh, this is, comes from an insecurity from my childhood, to your point, I'm an adult now. So anything that I have, again, I don't even can speak for myself, I just take ownership. 
yes, this may have come from my dad. Yes, this may have come from my mom. Whatever. I'm an adult now. So I've recognized it. That's very hard for people. So I want to give people super grace for that. But once you recognize it, what are you going to do about it? Yep. Period. Like that's as blatant as I am with myself. It's like now that you know, Lisa, this is a trigger. What are you going to do about it? Yep. It is not your husband's responsibility. It is yours. So what I've started to do is articulate the trigger to my husband or people around me that yep. I'm close to. Let them know it's my trigger. I'm working on it. And what I now do, if the people that I've told in real time, if I catch myself, I'll actually address it. So I'll even say to my husband, oh my God, you're so me. Oh my God, babe, I, I was just triggered. Apologies. This is on me. I'm still working on it. For now, can you not say X, Y, and Z words? Cause I'm still triggered by it. Yep. So I catch myself. I own it. I let him know I'm working on it. And that allows me to feel good about myself when I get triggered. But you also did something really important in that scenario, Liz. You invited, you enrolled, mm -hmm. you, you asked him to collaborate with you on what you're working on by saying, could you be mindful? of that tone, mm -hmm. you know, again, I'm not putting it on you. Yeah. And because he loves you, he'll be mindful. I remember after my father died very suddenly, um, I was very, I don't know why, but the way it struck me, I was very worried that suddenly my husband was going to drop dead. Like it was this, I knew it was trauma. I knew it would take time. But I remember we were at the gym together and normally we would meet at a certain spot after we worked out and he didn't come. And, I, and he wasn't there and he's very timely. And I went to the front desk and now this was only like two weeks after my father's death. So I said to the front desk, can you page my husband? They page my husband, still doesn't come. And then finally I say to her, he's like, well, he's not coming. I said, you know, can someone go look in the bathroom? Because he might've just been sitting on the toilet and just died. Literally, I said this to the front desk woman who's like, um, oh, does he have a heart problem? I was like, no, but sometimes people just die. She was like, uh, okay, so they go. So for he comes out and he's a little bit, a little perturbed. He's like, "You had me paged. You had someone. I was in the bathroom. You had someone come get. Like, what is going on?" And I was like, "You know, you might just die." I was like, started bawling. He was like, "Oh my god, babe, are you okay?" <laughs> like whatever. So we go outside and he was like, "I was like, listen, I know this is me, but I need you to not be late." Babe, I'm gonna work this out, but I need you to tell me where you are. Like, I need to know that you have not just died of a massive coronary. He's like, okay. And that, that invitation, even when you know it's you, when you're in a, a partnership where there's a lot of trust, you know Tom wants to be a part of your solution. I know my husband wants to be a part of my solution. I know the moment he saw me upset, whatever irritation was there was completely gone and replaced with absolute concern of like, what can I do to help? And so I do think if you're in a safe relationship, it's really powerful to say, hey, and I would love it if, while I'm still feeling this way, you can make sure to call me when you say you will, or you can make sure to be on time, or whatever the mm -hmm. thing would be. And again, we're not putting it on them, but we are inviting them to be a part of the solution, which is very loving. And I, I love that decipher. And then also, I think it allows you to give your partner the opportunity to either show up or not, right? Because if they're just like, well, yeah, it's your trigger. Like, you need to deal with it. That just shows you the type of person they are and the type of relationship that you're going to have. If you're holding true to your side of the street, I want to always improve. And the other person is just pointing, yeah, yeah. your side of the street is always messy. Um, that doesn't seem like a partnership. So it almost feels like a nice, I don't like to say test. That doesn't sit well with me, but a nice well, um, yes. reality to check in on. There is a barometer yeah. of what is your interest in their wellness and them sort of being optimally well. What is their interest in your optimal wellness. Mm. And I think that in long-term relationships, this has to be a part of the a part of the equation if it's going to last. I mean, we've been married 25 years, very happily. Congratulations. Why thanks. But it's it's you you work, you change, you grow, you pay attention to each other. And I could never do it. I could never have stayed or been in this relationship if I didn't trust him implicitly always has my best interest mm. always doesn't matter what the situation he's like what can i do 
How did it go? You're going to be great. You, it, it doesn't matter. Like, I know for sure he has my highest and best in, in his heart. Mm. And I feel the same about him. And I feel like working towards that in relationships, this is what we're talking about. Creating a safer space when we're triggered to be able to talk about it. Taking ownership, what you said before, at least, is so important to creating healthy, lasting bonds is us being able to self-reflect and go, huh, I'm going to get radically curious about why I reacted that way. Why was I so mad? Why was I so hot about that? Why did I, why did I burst into tears? And we look at that with curiosity, not judgment of ourselves. There's so much information there. Mm. How do we start to assess a fine line between triggers that you have learned versus acceptable learned disrespect. Now, what I mean by that is, especially when it comes to family, siblings, mm -hmm. parents, things like that, there's a way that things have happened. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes a trigger of yours is from the childhood that you can get over, or sometimes you have a belief that this is basically learned disrespect and you don't think of it as a trigger and you think of it as just being yep. um, a part of you. And, and you think of it as legitimate. Yes, like, correct. I do not like this. I do not want to tolerate this. So the difference, what you're talking about, Lisa, is the difference between triggers and boundaries. So over here, with the sort of learned or accepted disrespect, we, as grown-ups, have to decide what are our own acceptable boundaries, which is, what are our preferences? What are our limits? What are our deal breakers? Right? What, what is just a non-negotiable? Like, no, I, I, that does not work for me. When you come from a family system where, let's say, there was um, intrusiveness, maybe it was very enmeshed, where everyone was in everyone's business, constantly giving you advice and telling you you're doing it wrong or whatever, as a grown-up, that's going to be challenging mm -hmm. to establish new boundaries with that old group of folks. If we look at boundaries and the way we interact in relationships as dances, mm -hmm. we look at our family of origin as like the original dance troupe because <laughs> <laughs> we've been dancing with those motherfuckers the longest, right? <laughs> so it makes it more challenging because they also see you as your 10-year-old self, your five-year-old self. They love to remind you of things, certain family systems, not mine, but others, where They'll be like, oh, look, look, look how cute. Look who's getting so healthy. Oh, look who's talking about their boundaries. Like mm -hmm. people will feel very threatened in a family system, especially in a mesh family system if you want to change it. But here's the thing. And I've helped thousands of clients over the years. Just opt out, right? You, you can choose boundaries that you do have control over. You may love your family. You may still want to go home. And you may choose to stay in a hotel. And many family systems, that is offensive. You don't want to stay in your high school bedroom with your spouse and your kids on the blow-up mattress? No. In fact, I don't. So I'll be staying in a hotel. And I can't tell you how many clients, family of origin, had a problem with that. And I was like, but here's the thing. If the choice is you staying in a hotel, so it's actually a vacation for you, or you not going, they'll probably get over it. But again, what it means is that we can't be so thin-skinned Right? If you want to be healthy in your life, you have to be self-determined. Right? If your parents want you to come home or your mother wants you to come home and stay in your high school bedroom and you don't want to, don't. Mm -hmm. Mom, it's not personal. I love you. I'm going to see you the whole time I'm here. I want to sleep well, which I don't when I'm in a twin bed like, or whatever it is. You can tell the truth and if they're like, I can't believe you and you're so selfish. I see that you're upset and I'm sorry, mom, but I really am not moving on this. Yeah, that's that's really powerful, hoping that they respond with kind, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, I hear you, fine, go and, you know, um, stay in a hotel. But you you sometimes get, I'm not sure what to call it, but like almost the stacking effect where you have like your mom saying it and then your cousin says yeah. it and then everyone jumps on board. And now what it seems like is it's almost, especially if you're the one that's done the growth, To toxic normality. I almost like don't yeah. know what to what word to use, but that, that is a thing that, that hit me where I was like, oh, everybody 
is to- uh, has this toxic behavior and so it just seems normal to them yes. and um, I'm just going to give you a real world example that happened to me recently and this is actually where the question comes from because you're just going to be my therapist for today <laughs> so um, I was with my family there were 17 of us cousins uncles aunts all in Vegas at the same time um, we haven't all been together for so long and so you can imagine all my family they, we've all grown up together and so I'm in this fi- family dynamic And somebody, I don't want to blast them, but somebody turns around to someone else very close to someone in my family. And they're like, hey, ugly, hey, ugly, shouting across the table to someone that I care about. They're just calling them ugly. And I found it so damn disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And now in moments in my past when I can actually put, I've heard it a thousand times. It's never registered before. Never, except this time. Mm -hmm. And this time I heard it and I was like, That is so disrespectful. And so I stepped in. Mm -hmm. And so I said, please don't call them that. I find that very disrespectful. And everyone stopped and everyone like, (gasps) the the air comes out of the room. I said it in a very calm manner. I said it very politely, but everyone stopped. And they were like, why is that disrespectful? What do you mean? Why is that disrespectful? I always call her ugly. And I was like, in that moment, I was like, oh shit, well, it is disrespectful to me. But I didn't ask the other person if it was disrespectful to them. So now the dynamic was they stepped in and they said, actually, I don't find this disrespectful. And in that moment, Terry, I was like really stuck. I was like, oh, shit, this seems like a disrespectful moment. I've now gotten the confidence in my eyes to speak up to it and say that is disrespectful. Please don't insult someone in my family. But now everybody else. It's saying, no, it's fine. So now, Terry, I I question, Mm -hmm. is it toxic normality? Have I been triggered because I got called ugly when I was a kid? Mm -hmm. So that's now the thing of like the 14-year-old Lisa won't get bullied anymore. And I've really been processing on if I could do it again because I never beat myself up over doing it. Was I right in standing up for the person in my family? Was it toxic normality? Or was I triggered and actually this whole thing started with me and having a sensitivity to the word ugly i i have to say i think it's that and i'll tell you why yeah because the person here's the thing someone this is between two people and you were the third party if this person were it's up to this person to be like because because you don't know what the ribbing is between them what the what the the social norms yeah it was very socially normal for them to do that yes and the thing is, if she didn't find it or he didn't find it offensive, it's it's a misuse of the word. It's not actually calling the person out. Right. If she didn't find it offensive, I don't imagine it means the same, but it, do, it doesn't even matter. The bottom line is your side of the street was over here. Mm. This person's side of the street's here. This person's side of the street here. Yeah. And so what happened is I do believe that you find it so offensive, partly because in normal conditions, it is. It's not a nice thing to call someone, mm-hmm. no matter what. Mm-hmm. But people's social norms and family norms are weird. Like, I can't say, you know what I mean? Because I've been in family norms where they're talking to little kids and they're like, oh, you're such a bad boy. You're so bad. Are you bad? Like, I just remember this, that experience once. And I was like, why the hell is this grandmother continuing to call? And they were like, oh, no, this is just, this is just... It's just affection. I was like, that is so weird. But in that family, that was affection. Mm -hmm. For you, the um, chance to be seen when you weren't seen Mm -hmm. at 14 or you weren't seen Mm -hmm. at 10, I think it was just too tempting. You were triggered, but also it was like, you want to be like, I'm not putting, this is bullshit. Like, I'm not putting up with this now. I am going to say something. So I think it's a combination because it's not... What you're seeking, it's not this black and white where it's like, are they toxic? Are they not? It's not because there's too many mitigating factors to be able to conclusively say what it is. Because I have no idea what's between these two people. Mm. I have no idea what that meaning is. We know from you because you've been generous enough to tell us what was triggered within you. So I'm going to go with that. Mm. That's amazing. I'd love to go a little deeper if you don't mind. Because as you go to like the meaning... Going back to what if you've been brought up 
with a toxic attitude that this is how we show love, right? How many people get physically abused or yep. mentally abused where it's like, oh, but that's, that's how my dad showed me love. So I just, accept it from my partner we would say no 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 that's abuse walk away so how do you actually decipher what is toxic normality mm -hmm. um and what's just like sensitivity so to your point it's like maybe maybe this person wasn't sensitive like i was or maybe they have the misguided illusion that that means love to them yeah or maybe it does mean love to them oh. do you know what i mean because we don't know what the we don't know what the code language means between those two people of calling someone ugly even though that sounds like a stretch but i don't think it is so let's let's take let's take up teasing for example mm. because this is this is the whole thing listen somebody abusing you if they're saying it's for your own good i'm doing it because i'm protecting you because i want you to learn maybe but i i don't Unconsciously, people will say, this is the way I was loved, so now I'm going to love my kids this way, right? Unconsciously. But most people don't think of being physically abused as love, right? Right. So let's look at it from the point of view of, like, teasing. Many families cannot have words of affirmation or kindness, but the way that they show that they care about you is, like, they, they rip on you. They, they tease you. I personally hate teasing. Because I'm so, I can't stop seeing it as what it is, yeah. which is like passive aggressive aggression, because PS, that's what it is. So I think that let's say you're in a situation where someone is teasing you and then they, they deny your reality and they're like, you're so sensitive, you can't take a joke. I always will help my clients to walk through saying, hey, here's the thing it's not funny. So it's not a joke to me. And I'm just making a simple request that you stop. I don't like it. And if you don't stop, I'll leave. Mm -hmm. And then you leave. Like you have a choice as an adult to find people will treat you the way you let them. And as a grown up, you have a right and the ability to have rock solid boundaries and not put up with stuff that doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. You really do. And listen, we spend X amount of time with our family, right? You had how many days with your family and you had this sort of one incident, right? So we, we take the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. We understand. You're so curious and this is what you do for a living. You're able to look at it and go, okay, I really want to know. Is this me? Is this them? Is it just the combination? But to your point of sort of normalized toxicity and how do you know? If it's that, what I care about with my clients is how they feel. What I care about with you is how you feel. It matters how you feel. And then we dive into why you feel that way. Mm -hmm. But if something doesn't feel good to you, that's valid. We'll get into figuring out why, but, but let's not dismiss it and be like, well, you're too sensitive. Like if it doesn't feel good to you, I want people to care. Like my, my biggest advice for folks is that you must you must think that what you think how you feel what you want it must matter to you more than what anyone else wants thinks and feels that is the baseline of how we build self-empowered lives doesn't make you selfish doesn't make you mean but what you think how you feel and what you want has to matter to you more than anyone else and listen what my husband wants thinks and feels is right up there for me it's 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 close but here's the thing no one can know that about you but you so i don't think that someone else's thought about how you responded to something should be more important than you being like i'm gonna get curious because i had a reaction and how i feel matters to me i'm gonna decode it because I don't want to feel this way.
That makes sense. Yes, yeah, so much sense. And that was basically what I did. And I, I went through like a bit of a roller coaster because I was like, I feel really good about myself. I've stuck up for the person yeah. that I've heard all these years and I've never once said anything. And then I felt badly because I was like, well, I didn't, I felt guilty because I was like, well, I called that person out in front of everyone else. Was that the nice thing to do? Right. So then the guilt came mm -hmm. and then the, the internal, oh, Lisa, maybe you were too sensitive and maybe you spoke out of turn. Right. And then the doubt of like, like, oh shit, should I have said that? Should I have not? Um, and then my conclusion was actually, to be honest, I am where I am. I said it. And so now, how do I improve? How do I get better and stronger um, and then do better? And so um, I then spoke to the other person afterwards and I basically said, look, I stuck up for you. I don't know if you wanted me to or not. Please let me know next time if actually you would rather me not. And maybe this is a me issue and not a you issue. And their response was, I just want to say thank you so much because it came from some, they actually said, I don't take offense to it, but I want to thank you because it showed me you cared. And so I was like, okay, I don't want to lean into it because then it's like, I'm going to stick up for everyone because I care, right? And now you're just stepping on other people's side of the street to your point. Um, but that was how I handled it and just had then having a transparent conversation after yep. with that person about the struggle I was going through yep. on whether I should have spoken up for them or not. But I feel like here's the thing. So much came out of it. So I'm glad there's no mm, regrets mm. because so much growth for you and so much realization and you got to hear from the other person that it made them feel loved. Yeah. So the bottom line is, you know, no, listen, no, no risk, no reward, right? It's like you did something and I gotta say, that's stepping up for that person, which was really in essence stepping up for yourself, is did something good for you. Mm -hmm. So with psychotherapeutic stuff and healthy stuff and mental health and relational stuff, it's very rare that we're like, like we really want it to be super black and white, like did I do the wrong thing, did I do the right thing? But the nuances are the things of where we learn, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so there was something you said earlier, I didn't want to interrupt you. But you even say, like, sometimes it's hard to, you know, know, decipher, is it you, is it, you know, toxic normality? Am I being gaslit? Is that why I'm being crazy? Or am I not crazy at all? So you talk about the three stages of gaslighting that we can maybe use as a flag to recognize whether we've been gaslit yes. or not. Yes. Well, in the beginning, especially if it's if it's a new relationship or whatever, you're kind of shocked when someone is basically lying to you, you know, or or saying you agreed to this thing that you know you didn't. So disbelief is is the beginning where you're like, I can't. Is this happening? Is it not? But it's if you're an empath, a lot of times we we take it onto ourselves, right? But in the very beginning, you're gonna want to fight. You're going to want to be like, no way, that didn't happen. So the, the second stage is being defensive, is what really like, oh, we just want them to understand so bad. We want to be like, we were sitting in the parked car. We were right in front of Trader Joe's. We were, you know, you're, you're, mm. or be defending yourself, like in saying, I did not do that. And then there comes a point, especially when you're with a master manipulator where it's like you just give in. Hmm. It's like you just give up. And that third stage can be depression, where it's almost like we collapse in on ourselves. Because there's only so long that you can be shocked by someone's behavior, try to defend your own position. There's a point where you've expended so much energy in doing that that it's almost like in the in the phase of depression, it's almost like they just kind of win because you're sort of like, okay, maybe I did, maybe I did say it. And that that is a scary place to get to. Yeah, God. Are there any certain things or questions you can ask in each of those stages to start assess? So if you're in disbelief, to your point, it would be like, what do you mean, right? I assume that mm -hmm. it isn't a great strategy. So are there certain questions or statements you can say to see if you're being gaslit or not? Again, it speaks to a pattern of behavior. Mm. So I don't know, there's no magic words to come up with like magic questions that will reveal it. It's over time. And so, and a lot of these manipulators are really, really good. So again, don't let people isolate you from those that you love. Mm. Make sure that if you have best friends who you trust, keep them in your life. Talk to them about what's going on. Like, 
a lot of times this type of manipulation happens slowly over time, so it's very insidious. It isn't just like someone being like, the sky is green, you know? So it's not so obvious where you can be like, no, it isn't what you're talking about. It's little by little by little. They'll take a kernel of truth and then spin it into something that is untrue. And then they can always go back to that kernel. We were talking about the vacation and then you said you would pay for it or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you remember you were talking about the vacation, but you didn't agree that their friends could come or you didn't agree to whatever the thing is. So even in that, if someone is gaslighting you in that sense, you're like, oh, what do you mean? Yes, you said you were going to come. So then they maybe use the guilt treatment. So it's kind of like tactic on tactic on tactic. Oh, yeah. um, and then your, um, your response to, well, maybe I did say it, right? And so now you start to doubt yourself. You start to question. You even said that before. Um, how do you, in those moments, take potential inventory of it happening and as it starts to re potentially repeat, because I assume that a one-time offender is probably going to be a two-time offender. Yeah. If it's really gaslighting, yes. How do you, I guess, get out of it? Well, you have to go back to holding yourself in high esteem and deciding that you don't deserve this shit from anybody. And I think that it, it's over time. You have to really be honest with yourself about how often do you, quote unquote, get the story wrong? How often are you on the receiving end of being criticized mm -hmm. by this person in your life? How often are you giving in? How often are you self-abandoning in this relationship? Because if someone is regularly gaslighting you, this is an unhealthy relationship. This is a toxic relationship. There is not enough joy mm -hmm. for you to stay. And so slowly but surely, think about making a very secret plan to leave. Mm. Like that's really what we're talking about. You know, I'm, when we talk about the extremes, because gaslighting is an extreme, everyone in life will do small things. We will have selective memory. We will remember things wrong and be like, no, you said you would do it. But if it is not a pattern, a regular pattern of behavior, it's not a conscious manipulation tactic. Mm. Right? We all are going to make mistakes or we all are going to do those things once in a while. So again, it's really identifying the pattern of behavior because that is your evidence. Mm. Write it down. Write it down. Talk to a friend and be honest with yourself. I know it's scary to leave a relationship, but be honest with yourself about how long has it been since you've been happy in this relationship? How long has it been since you felt seen? Do you feel loved or do you feel controlled and owned? Because they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you deserve to feel loved for who you are. How, how much are you walking on eggshells? If your answer is all the time, that's an unhealthy relationship. But actually truly loved, because I've heard you say a quote which I find fascinating is, giving is love, overgiving is dysfunctional. Yes. <laughs> and using the love and the giving as a manipulation tool, um, I've you know heard you say where you're like, people will often say, but I did it for you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, uh, I didn't ask for it. So now the guilt treatment comes back in. Yeah. Um, that one was, I was like, oh my God, yes, that's true how that gets used very often. It's really, it's really actually important because I think that people get surprised mm -hmm. when they hear giving is loving, overgiving is dysfunctional. Where they're like, what do you mean? I'm giving more because I love them so much. I'm like, no, because there is a string attached. There is an expectation. It is a means of controlling the other person. A lot of times when we overgive, we want to make it be that there's no way they can leave us. Mm -hmm. There's no way they can say no to things. We're, we're um, securing our place by overgiving. But when we think about high-functioning codependency, which is exactly what it sounds like, this is a uh, covert or overt bid to control the other person's outcome, what's happening in their life, how they feel. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to feel bad. So we're coming up with all the solutions to their problems. That's a form of overgiving or auto advice giving. Mm. So I think it's important that we have to, we question our own motives 
in a loving way. We become self-reflective of like, huh, am I doing more than I should in this relationship? Am I doing, more? Am I doing things for others that they can and should do for themselves? Mm-hmm because it makes me feel needed or wanted or loved? And am I also secretly resentful for the amount that I do? Because that's where it always ends up. And I think vice versa though, right? Wouldn't that be a good manipulation tool for somebody else to use on you? Where it's like, oh, but they shower with me with all these gifts and they love, I mean, they take care of me, right? Mm -hmm. And basically it's a manipulation tool potentially for them to hold on to you. Yes. One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. Oh yeah. I mean, there's another, one of the manipulation things, there's another thing is bribery. That was on that list where, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Whether it's bribery that I'm threatening to take something away from you, Mm -hmm. or whether it's over gift giving and being like, if you do this thing with me, then then we'll take that vacation to wherever or I'll, I feel like people giving push gifts after someone has a kid. I never even got that. I don't even understand. Anyway, Mm. I inherited my children. I don't know. But maybe I'd want one too. But I was like, wait a minute. Someone has a child and someone... That to me feels a little bribey. Like I could be wrong. Maybe it's nice. Maybe somebody wants a nice piece of jewelry. But I'm like, that's a little weird. So that's something to be aware of too. Is is all of the lavishing. Because that also can fall under, under the category of love bombing. Mm. And <clears throat> as a person who's receiving it in real time, it, I assume it feels good. So you don't necessarily perceive it as something negative at the time. But really, um, how would someone assess right now, like whether it's a power play or not? Oh, you know it. Listen, especially in families, mm. especially with family with wealth. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, Grandpa's yeah, going to buy you an apartment. In New- exactly. <laughs> Watch that show. That's, yeah. that's all you need to see. But, you know, Grandpa's going to buy you a, <clears throat> an apartment in New York City. And then every time grandpa wants you to do something, you're doing it. Mm. And then every family vacation that grandpa plans, even though you don't want to do it, you're exhausted, you don't fit, whatever, you're doing it. Like a, there's a lot of times there are strings attached and that those purse strings mm. are used as manipulation tactics. They're like gifts, but they're not. Mm. And I always say to my clients, I've had many clients from family wealth who are like, I can't take it. I'm like, listen, stop taking the money. Stop it. You are smart and successful. If you really want to be self-determined and you know they're using wealth and that money to manipulate you, stop taking it. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens then. Then you are yourself. But a lot of times people are like, I don't know, man. I'm like, okay. Then it's a conscious choice. Right. So then you are colluding and in agreement that you're going to take that money and that requires some shit of you that you better be willing to do. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Like, that's okay. That That's a choice you can make. But make it a choice. Stop complaining. Yeah. Oh, my God, I love that. Wait, is it the same? Would it be the same for flattery? I've heard you say that, whereas, like, people flatter and then ask for something. Yes, flattery is definitely can be a form of manipulation. I really hate it when I feel like somebody's working me. Like, mm. I know it immediately. It feels so not real. How do you know? What are the signs? Because too, it's too much, the flowery language. It's too much. Hmm. It, it's saying too, too much. Like, I don't mind if someone just says thank you that really helped me. Great. That, that's real. That's genuine. But too much. You're the, you're the this, you're the that. I don't, first of all, I don't need that because I know who I am. If you want to tell me what I did for you, great. That's fine. But there's something about, I can feel when someone is being less than, Genuine. And then, of course, that you will also notice, and uh, you look for patterns. Mm-hmm. The person tells you how amazing you are, and then before you know it, they're hitting you up for a, a, a favor. Yeah. They want something from you. Can you make this introduction to this person? Can you do this thing? No. I can't. 
but thanks. Unless I want to. <laughs> I love it. Because, again, I always go like, there's two sides to it. So with flattery, if you're insecure like I was, any flattery just feels so good that I'm like, of course I'll do that for you yeah. because I so seek the flattery for the validation. Um, but then the other side is maybe if you don't think highly of yourself at all and someone's giving you flat flattery, you don't believe them. So now you actually think they have an ulterior motive, but maybe they don't. And maybe they're actually yeah. just being flattering. Totally. So that's where I'm always just like this one little thing Thing can be so detrimental or can be you know uh, positive yeah but depending on how you decipher it because i think again based on what your traumas are your triggers are and where you come from yep. then your reaction to something can be wildly different than someone else's reaction yes but you'll have evidence right you will in time if someone's flattering was a form of manipulation yeah that evidence is going to show up they're going to expect you to do something. They're going to ask you for something. So really, if you're patient, your, your answers will come. And maybe they just think you're an amazing person and they were just telling you the truth about how you changed their life. Mm. And it would be nice to also be able to let that in. And then be mindful. Yeah, <laughs> If they exactly. ask you, they're, they're going to hit you up for something. Yeah, Terry, homie, where can people find you and just everything you're doing? Go to terrycole.com, which is just T-E-R-R-I-C-O-L-E. -E. I have a book called Boundary Boss, all about boundaries. You can follow me on Instagram. I've got courses coming up. Um, Boundary Boot Camp is coming up where you can do eight weeks live with me, which I only do once a year. So that's coming up, which is very exciting. And all that stuff is on my uh, website. Keep watching right now to learn how to control your emotions when you feel like someone has triggered you. Where I really want to start is so many of us um, react to certain things we get triggered in situations whether it's in relationships with our partners whether it's in business or with our friends and i don't know about you but so many of us the next day we regret the things we've said we regret the things we've done we don't think we don't show up as our true selves and you really talk so eloquently about triggers about where triggers come from about how we can identify them and how we can start working through them so that they no longer become triggers and so that's where I really want to start. So if you don't mind breaking down the different types of triggers, um, and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. I mean, I think you're, you're saying a whole mouthful when you're acknowledging how few of us are connected and are living from our authentic space. And I think those moments of reactivity are really prime evidence for how shameful so many of us can feel when we're in those explosive situations. And ultimately, I will make a case and my hope for the workbook is to really make a case for all of you on this journey that those moments really aren't who we are, whether it's the habits that we're living daily or those moments where we can't navigate our emotions. Oftentimes they are coming from our past experiences, coming from environments where very few of us were taught how to safely regulate our feelings. And what happens in our current adult moments is as if we go back in time, mm. in this time warp, which is a little bit of the reason why it feels a bit immature and we feel so shameful when we're living those explosive reactions. So I think to understand where we're coming from when we're not behaving in alignment with what our heart wants, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we are all compassionate or have the ability to be compassionate, connected humans. So understanding you know, why we're exploding, I think gives us part of uh, the elixir, if you will, the healing, though of course then it's how do I shift in those moments? So if I understand this isn't me, how do I create the space to reconnect with what I really want to do, say, or how I really want to be in those moments? Yeah, oh my God, <laughs> God. Like when you said the word shame, 100% that hit me, right? How many of us feel shameful after mm -hmm. we've had this and when you want to show up, and I like to use the word badass, right? Badass, yes. confident, enter a relationship where you feel like you've got your own back, that you can actually be yourself um, or in work. The thing that does hold us back a lot, I do think, is our reaction to things, is we can't control other people, but the thing that we can possibly hopefully control is ourselves. But when we don't know where it comes from, when we don't know why we're having these reactive moments, it can feel very overwhelming and we can feel lost in not knowing how to handle it. And I actually got a quote of yours that I love. Um, childhood trauma doesn't come back as a feeling, it comes back as a reaction. When people look like they're overreacting to something, they're not. Yes. So not. take me back to then how we start to identify 
where this is coming from, what different types of triggers there are, and then how we can start to peel back the onion, understanding them, and then start to, I don't know, reverse probably isn't the right word, but maybe um, come to a place where we're no longer having those triggers dictate how we show up. What's I think really important to understand in in that quote as well is also not to minimize while Mm. our feelings do feel disproportionate, for lack of a bigger word, really big for whatever objectively might be happening. I think some of us might seek to like minimize or maybe we've been told we're so dramatic, our emotions are so over the top. And I think a really kind of point I wanna hammer home before I kind of go into what to do, how to navigate these moments differently is just to create some space to honor the feelings that we're having. Because while they might not be objectively mapping on to what's happening now, there is a similarity in circumstance and context in underlying feeling that we're having that's contributing to their bigness. And I say this because there's so many of us who have lived a lifetime of shaming ourselves for our emotions in particular, of having this idea that we need to suppress or squash them down and not allow them the space that they are. Because when we're talking about these emotional reactions, we actually are talking about things that are sensations that are stored in our body that for many of us have been accumulating from a lifetime of similarly overwhelming experiences. And without support in our childhood, without someone to help us feel safe as we're having bigger and bigger emotions to make sense of them and then to figure out how to bring myself back into regulation or really simply calm, Mm. a responsive grounded place where I can say, okay, I'm feeling this emotion. I might take the information that it's giving me and I can still make a choice about what I do next. When we don't have that modeling we don't have that lived experience with another caregiver who can join us on that journey of making sense of our emotions, we are going to rely on a much more reactive way because that, for many of us, is the only way we can find safety, whether it's the exploders out there Mm -hmm. who scream and yell, right, when we're outwardly upset at something or when we're inwardly, I should say, upset with something, it comes outward in our expression. And then of course we have the many of us who maybe we're not screaming and yelling, maybe we're avoiding, we're distracting ourselves, we're numbing the way that we feel, or we're avoiding uncomfortable conversations or experiences altogether, again, as our main way of keeping ourselves safe. And then of course, we have the whole bunch of us, myself was very much part of this group, who because stress was so consistently present and I was so under supported for so long, screaming and yelling only worked a bit removing myself only worked a bit and then we the last step on that ultimate train is becoming completely disconnected living as i say on a spaceship where i feel numb i feel aloof and i don't really feel connected to the space around me so those are just simple examples of what is really based in an overwhelming response the only way i can create safety is by becoming reactive in that way and that's what we'll see our then self doing Mm -hmm. somewhere in time into adulthood of course feeling very shameful Because who wants to scream and yell at our loved ones? Who wants to avoid things that are uncomfortable? Who wants to live a life that is completely numb? But again, at one time, that was the only way that we were able to keep ourselves safe when we didn't have someone helping us navigate our emotions calmly, which then becomes the task in adulthood. How do I create that space to see my emotions for what they are and to still be able to choose what I do next and remain connected to those around me and myself when I'm choosing what I'm doing next. Yeah, oh my God, that was so amazing. To see our emotions for what they are. That was so powerful because so many of us judge our emotions. I shouldn't be feeling this way. So especially when it comes to triggers because the other person is almost looking at you like what the fuck is going on, right? Because if you don't understand another person's wounds or triggers or childhood trauma, their reaction may seem like you've like, hang on a minute, you're crazy. It's like, oh my God, I can't handle this. And it seems like it's overreaction, but really does stem from something um, deep. And so being able to view it, how on earth do you start doing that? Because I think so much of us judge ourselves based on other people judging us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, judgment, I think for many of us, going back even to shame, as we talked a bit about earlier, I mean, so many of us are so internalized with this process of feeling shameful. And it does come from this imagined idea of what we think and maybe what we hear Mm. other people, you Mm. know, are assessing us to be or not be in those moments. And, you know, to speak to your point, I think the more understanding 
that we have of what's happening inside us that oftentimes then allows us to gift that same understanding to partners mm -hmm. who are having explosive responses, right, that we can't understand. A big shift happens when you see someone. They might be behaving unsavorably in some way. And of course, this isn't to condone abuse. We always need mm -hmm. to have boundaries that are up. But I'm going to have a much different experience if I see you having what I might deem as an overreaction. If I view it or if I'm only reacting to maybe you're screaming and you're yelling or maybe you're ignoring me. If I am only seeing the surface, likely I'm going to be hurt. You might say something mean. You might not participate in a conversation that I'm feeling is important. So I might feel silenced in that moment. That's going to be really different than if I'm able to stand in the compassionate space of understanding, oh, I might not like that you're screaming and I might not like what you're saying. I might really want to have this conversation with you if you're avoiding me. However, if I see that this is coming from fear, if I can understand that you're feeling destabilized now, I might not know exactly why, I might not be feeling the same, but in my opinion, that really does then create more space for a new response, for something different than is reacting right to the hurt feeling mm. that on the surface is initially what comes up. Oh my God, that's so powerful. So I think it all stems from the knowing yourself, right? Understanding yourself, right. understanding your own triggers. Once you start to learn, you can then project. And there's actually one thing that recently Tom and I have been saying, so what would have to be true for that person to react in that way? Because I think of script writing, I think, okay, if I was to write the script and this person right now is screaming at me because I said, I don't like your shirt. What would have to be true that I've hurt them so much by me saying I don't like their shirt? Okay, let me backtrack. Maybe they were teased as a kid for the way they looked and they built their confidence just enough mm. to find the courage just to wear one shirt. And so now what I've done is trigger them. And so I tried to like kind of backtrack and just use the phrase, what would have to be true for them, them to experience this moment as overwhelm, anxiety, when I'm not sure what has happened to actually warrant, quote unquote, that behavior. Yeah, I think that's a really, really beautiful way to look at it. And, and the more information, of course, mm. when we're talking about our close friends, our loved ones, our partners, you know, some of us can fill in that story, though we, we don't have to. And oftentimes it is that explosive person who's arguing with the world around us. I mean, some of us, that becomes our character. It's outside Ooh. of these moments of where I'm upset and you don't like my shirt. I mean, some of us are so defensive by nature. I could go as far as to call yeah. it nature. And again, make an argument as so far as that there was a reason, right? There's a reason that this person had to become so defensive probably in childhood where being defensive, wearing that armor, maybe even fighting or scrapping my way through instances of overwhelming feelings, whether it was abuse or neglect or whatever it was in our home. For some of us, that was our only way mm -hmm. of you know, creating some semblance of safety or grounding. And again, we, when we look on the surface, that really defensive person can be very difficult to relate to, to connect mm -hmm. with. But when we shift that focus and understand that that served them, all of our habits, as far as I'm concerned, and a big reason why I'm always talking about how habitual we are, all of our habits are grounded in a best kept or a best attempt at creating safety, at adapting to an environment. The problem becomes when we continue to repeat those habits as our environments shift and change, as our relationships shift and change, as we grow and develop and mature and have access to other tools because the reality of it is in those emotional moments, we're going to rely on those habitual reactions mm -hmm. because at one time, not only do they keep us safe, they're predictable. Mm -hmm. I know what happens next. I know if I scream loud enough, that threat will go away. And that's safer than what if I don't scream loud enough? The, the, un, the unpredictability of what happens next in new choices will keep us locked in the patterns, especially when our, we're threatened, especially when we feel unsafe. Oh my God. Okay, so in saying all that, girl, how do we start to identify these habits? Because I actually love what you're saying. And there was um, something in your book, I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's something like actions are not who we are. Yes. Um, how then, I love that because it's non-judgmental. It's beautiful. But knowing that it comes from our childhood, knowing that it, look, this may not be ex you know who you are, but it is a habit that you have adopted from childhood. How do we start to identify that? In fact, let's go deeper onto the triggers and then how we start to identify the habits that are tied to the triggers. Because I didn't even think about the fact that, that even triggers have different categories. Yes. 
So I, I yesed pretty much any version <laughs> of what you said I said because in my opinion, what, what the workbook is about is discovering, exploring our habit self, mm -hmm. all of the mm -hmm. habits and patterns that create the life around us, create our day, create our relationships, and of course, growing conscious of them so that we can begin to make choices that are more in alignment with with what we want. So I probably said multiple versions because throughout the book, we what we really mm -hmm. are exploring is how to become conscious of those habits. I, I always will talk about the foundation of change being that practice of conscious awareness, mm -hmm. learning how to see ourselves. What are the habits that create our day? Imagining that maybe some listeners are probably shaking their heads and wondering, oh, I don't have habits. What do you mean? I have, actually, I'm, I'm problematic because I need to have habits and I don't mm -hmm. have them. In reality, we all have habits. We have habits in terms of the way we naturally care for our body. How is it that you sleep? You eat, you rest, you move, you breathe. All of that has become, more often than not for most of us in adulthood, very habitual. Mm -hmm. Peeling back a layer, of course, and we begin the journey in the workbook with that body, really taking a deep dive, exploring all of those different habits that we could have, many of which we learned in childhood, most of which might not be serving the unique body that we are born into. Then we peel back that next layer into the mind mm. and begin to explore all of the different habitual behaviors again through this conscious process of observation, seeing ourselves, actually waking up, say, tomorrow morning and paying attention. Don't allow that autopilot to drift you through your day, take you through those morning habits. Actually observe what are the first few things that you do in the morning? What does your mealtime habits look like? in terms of your emotions or your mental habits, beginning to pay more attention to your thoughts. You'll discover quite soon that we're not telling ourselves new unique tales throughout the day. We are talking to ourselves throughout the day. Most of us though are narrating our life in, you've guessed it, a very habitual way. Mm -hmm. We're filtering everything that's happening to, uh, happening to us, telling ourselves the same story. So the way we can see our habit self and create a bit of space to start to make new choices is by paying attention, learning how to be that conscious observer and either seeing externally how we're participating in our life or internally mm. and how that is coloring how we're externally participating in our life. Oh my God. That's what I love about your book. Like you really do hold people's hands all the way through. Um, how do we start to identify what habit is I'm going to use the word good or bad. You probably hate that. In fact, what better words are there? Because would you, would you say a habit is good or bad? I would say it is, objectively. Okay, I a love habit that. just is. Okay. And then we get to decide, of course, if the result of that habit right, is in alignment with the direction that we want to see our life going in and or if it isn't. And I'm only pausing on that because... I think when we do get into judgment mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. good, bad, I mean, first we have to unbox how subjective, right? I could sit here and tell you what's good for me and you could be like, oh, that's actually terrible. That's not good, it's right. bad for me. Um, we are very black and white in our thinking. And I think, again, that could back us into a corner. So when we're talking about being conscious, it's about being objective. So just literally seeing habits for what they are. They're just a habitual pattern. Mm -hmm. That is all. And then how do I so love that? I love your answers. So if we do that, how do we then start to see if it does align with our true selves? Because very often, I'm just going to speak for myself, very often I can convince myself something because I either believe, want it so badly or don't want something so badly. So as humans, I think we're really easy, not easy, but we adapt to ourselves of what we it feels comfortable right now mm -hmm. instead of calling ourselves out on what may not actually be in alignment. Yes. And I mean, what a mouthful of wisdom in terms of we will always gravitate to what is comfortable now. And what is comfortable now, again, like I said earlier, is what is familiar now. Mm -hmm. So this is where it becomes really difficult for some of us to not only have a more objective vantage point, because as I like to say it, we are blinder to ourselves. I know me so well. I know all of the filters of my life. I've excluded things that don't fit in with how I imagine myself and my life to be. And it's really hard for me to pull myself and kind of hover above and mm -hmm. see the parts, the aspects of me, right, that, that I'm missing. So learning, I think, how to, to see the more fuller picture mm -hmm. and really being honest, I think, is another part of the journey in terms of whether or not the decisions I'm making now, which might feel good because they're comfortable, do they serve 
what I want, what I desire, the direction, right, that I want to go to. And ultimately mm -hmm. that becomes our individual process. So it's getting clear on an objective about, okay, well, what are the habits that are that are happening, that I'm living? What choices am I making or what reactions are, are participating mm -hmm. in creating the life around me? And then really taking that moment of assessment, you know, does this feel good? good does this be, is this in a direction that's taking me closer to whatever it is that i imagine that i want for myself and if we have the supportive friends the loved ones of course of a trusted nature not opening ourselves up to feedback from people that really don't know us they can often offer us and sometimes offer us in moments where we don't want to hear mm -hmm. their feedback that more objective vantage point this is where we do start to hear from relationships maybe habits that don't serve the relationship. We maybe do get feedback from partners in these explosive moments that, you know, we're hurting feelings and then we can allow someone else's perspective to be part of our journey. But of course, this is for trusted people. This isn't opening ourselves up for mm -hmm. feedback from a million people on the internet who don't know us, but it's learning again, separation. Can I view my habits? Can I do so objectively? And can I get really honest about the role I'm playing and how close that brings me to my desired outcome. How do you do that if you're still feeling the wound, like you're still really living in the trauma, bringing back those types of things can be another trigger, couldn't it? Absolutely, and, and any time, I mean, really even going back to these moments of being activated, being yeah. destabilized, being explosive, or being, you know, avoidant, whatever it is. And again, the reason why the workbook begins with that journey in the body is because safety is is so incredibly important creating you know the ability to feel that discomfort be connected to it and return myself to peace to calm to balance is, is absolutely 100 percent part of that journey so when i hear you say you know what if the wound is active what if i'm having all of the feels i'm upset i'm dysregulated mm -hmm. then not only are we talking kind of logically oh well yes just find that moment of peace and calm, we're actually talking about those body-based tools, mm. ways to connect with my body, to release that overwhelming energy or to ground it and calm it if it's too much and too overwhelming. And for a big reason, understanding the role of the body was a big reason that I shifted my practice from what was very much more of a traditional mm. cerebral, let's just theorize about this because what I had seen time and time again is no amount of theory, want better, in those moments of reactivity can shift the way my body is reacting because my body is playing an absolute role. If my body doesn't feel safe, it's only a matter of time before I'm trying again to regulate in those older habitual ways. I love that so much because I'm definitely the person I try to think my way through everything. Right. I try to think my way through my own emotions. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, Lisa, you're feeling this, but come on, you shouldn't be feeling. Okay. But I use all the bad, the yeah. shouldn'ts, which I always try to catch myself in real time. Um, but so often we do that um, where, where I should say, at least in, in our space where it's like, oh, you listen to the podcast, you read the books, right? right. And she's like, I know what to do. Yeah. It's like, you know, and it's like, I can think my way through without actually listening to the body. So now when people are listening to this right now, how do they start to do that? Because I think it's so beautiful to open up that connection between the mind, the body. And you've said like our body holds so much trauma. Um, and so I didn't even think ever really think about the body holding trauma I always thought oh if I don't if my brain doesn't go there then I'm fine right and very true to form so many of us mm -hmm. actually rely on thinking about right. our emotions as a, a form of escape I lived my whole life from my shoulders up mm. whether it was always analyzing the racing thoughts that I have endless self-analysis and then over time becoming so overwhelmed by that I just, oh, completely checked out and my mind went blank and it was as if there was no body from the shoulders down for me and a lot of us can enter into thinking over analyzing and mis misinterpret and think that what we're doing is oh i'm being conscious and again conscious is a state of observation it's actually not a state of endless critical thinking judging self-analysis trying to convince our way out of emotions at all again understanding that though is a adaptation, chances are that was a safer space, my mind, than spending time in that body. So when I talk about consciousness, it's learning not only how to be the observer, I break down very accordingly to the three sections of the book. We talk about body consciousness in that mm -hmm. whole first section and how can I begin to tune in 
to my body? Can I use my breath as a hook of my attention? Can I use my sensations? I mean, I'm sitting in a very nice, comfortable chair right now. Can I actually simply tune into how it feels to be in my Nicole's body in this chair? Mm -hmm. That might sound so simplistic for listeners, but for those of us who spend so much time in our minds, distract it, disconnect it, actually turning attention to what it feels like, my thighs, my back, these lovely cushions, is a, is a big shift of consciousness. And once I begin to consistently make that shift into my body, what then I will be met with likely is all of the sensations that I've accumulated over time. Because even if we've gotten very good at being distracted, at being disconnected, at not thinking that we're feeling anything because we're not paying attention to it, it doesn't mean that our body hasn't been accumulated it. And the reason, again, that we've probably shifted our focus for so long was because it it's too uncomfortable in this, in this body. So learning how to A, notice when I'm in my spaceship, in my balloon, endlessly thinking, distracting myself with thoughts, whatever it might be, and then learning in that moment to make that most empowering choice, which is okay, let me safely focus on my body. Let me ground my attention. Let me feel my heels on the ground. Let me feel my back on the chair. Let me pay attention to how my, I'm breathing in this moment. And now I'm consciously present in my body. And of mm. course we wanna practice that over and over and over again so that we can really begin to not only reconnect with our body, but over time, the safer we feel paying attention to it, the more than conscious will become of all of those underlying sensations. Oh, I love that. That's so tactical, which is beautiful. As you were talking, I was like, how much of our senses have been conditioned? So like the hearing, right? When you hear someone shout, it triggers you yes. because of childhood. The like when, as you were talking, so even with where you're, you're, you know, doing your senses, you're touching the sofa, you're smelling the air, right? I know like being, becoming aware is, has a lot to do with what are you seeing? What are you smelling? What are you mm -hmm. touching? What are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, I was like, oh, but what yes. if we've been conditioned for that to be actually a negative thing? Like how do we start to attend, uh, shine attention on the fact that we were conditioned to think of a smell in a certain way. Yes, 100%. And, and the, the reality of it is our, our memory in general, and especially when we're talking about trauma memory, it's not language-based. Right. It is sensory-based. Yes. And I'm sure many listeners probably have even had that experience of walking by and right smelling that cologne or that waft of aroma from that person in your past who hurt you, and now you might as well be back oh. in interaction with that person, my heart is racing, I feel nervous. Of course, I'm using a much more stressful no, course, past yeah. experience, but you're, you're absolutely right, Lisa, in terms of we have these imprints that are often sensory based, and then we carry that with us so much so that any similar smell, mm -hmm. sound, taste, sensation of any so sort actually brings us back in time, yeah. right? And then we live the visceral, likely dysregulation, reactivity, mm -hmm. attempt to keep ourselves safe as if we are that younger year person, whatever it was. And so to speak to your point, understanding that we have, and this is, I think, why trauma in and of itself and any of our emotional memories really are difficult for a lot of us to put into words. Um, not only do they happen at a time when some of us are actually pre-verbal, like before we even mm. have the capability to express language, but very much like I was describing kind of the way our senses are stored in our brain, the way our emotional memories are where, I should say, our emotional memories are stored in our brain. Of course, there's not one area, many areas of our brain light up at one point for one functioning, but none of them are language-based, they're all sensory. So again, knowing in those moments, exploring for ourselves, you know, what are sensations that might activate, trigger, whatever word you like to use, but bring up that deeper stuff, transporting us back in time. Of course, gifting us then not only compassion, I can understand maybe why walking past that perfume counter really caused that visceral reaction in me. But now I can open the opportunity for some more of that somatic work because mm -hmm. now I know that my body, my emotional brain is activated and I, I know I'm feeling unsafe as a result. And now I can make some choices to create some safety in my now moment. Because yeah, I love that because I was just thinking about, you know, when you get with somebody, if you've had a bad experience, especially in a relationship, these other sensories can start to rear their ugly heads, if you will, with a new partner if 
like the cologne is such a beautiful one actually because there's i think isn't it like the sensory in the nose there's no filter it goes mm -hmm. straight to the brain so mm -hmm. that's the one that you can't even mm -hmm. logistically like try and convince right. yourself mm -hmm. otherwise yeah our our, our sm sense of smell is really connected to the emotional memory sensation and it really kind of it bypasses a gate mm, a sensory mm -hmm. gate too so in terms of the imprint i think most of us will feel that one strongly but I, i'll make a, even a bigger global statement here even outside of our senses the reality of it is most of us are cycling in past memories in our way of being in our relationships similar experiences whether or not it's oh that smell that's activating this you know really traumatic incident a lot of us are operating in our relationships in general mm. based on our past relationship, mm. projecting you know, our parent figures in so many ways onto our current partners and not necessarily seeing the objective reality of the differences in them. Oh my God, is that trauma bond? That is trauma. So if you can take us actually from the, the trauma that happens as a kid, how that ends up being a trauma bond as adults, because it's such a awakening, I think, to the decisions we make, the choices we make, and then why we make them. Yeah, so we'll start by a trauma bond. Um, very generally, at least the definition that I like to offer for a trauma bond is our very habitual, patterned way of relating in our relationships or to other people. And with the idea being that much of it is conditioned or again, that same dynamic pattern, the same way I had to show up for mom, dad, or whomever was my core caregiver in childhood, usually then becomes that same role that I adopt in, into my adulthood. And what if we didn't have you know, a safe, grounded, caregiver with their own sense of self or separation, different needs, you know, able to then ground themselves through their emotions, allowing them to be present to us as a separate individual, being curious, helping us meet consistently the needs that we have in childhood, which were dependent on them to meet for us. So that's a really, really tall order. I pretty much just described what I like to call a unicorn because I've yet to find, you know, a, a human who's really had that level of caregiving because it's, it's very difficult. So many of us are raised, you know, in families that are transmitting intergenerational patterns or just simply ways of being. So much of it is influenced by ideas of parenting. I mean, there was up until recently a brand of parenting that would profess that children are literally to be seen, not heard. They don't have emotional needs, literally just keep them alive like a plant in the corner. <laughs> And that's, that's all is necessary. I mean, this was a brand of parenting oh, yeah. that, you know, that era. right, that, uh, you know, advisors, doctors would have said, yes, that's exactly how we treat children. Mm. And obviously now we know different. So I'm not minimizing or, or shaming parents mm. by any stretch of the imagination. I'm actually, what I believe is offering the very human reasons why very few of us had that caregiving. So what happens mm. is because we're dependent, we need these people to literally keep us physically alive at minimum. If they don't even want to acknowledge emotional need, our body needs someone to keep us alive. We're so attu attuned and adaptive that we will keep that connection at whatever cost to ourselves, meaning we will always show up in service of that relationship with that parent to get whatever little bit of love they can give us, even if that means squashing certain aspects of ourselves. And because very few of us had parents who were emotionally mature or able to tend to themselves, their emotions and create that separation. So many of us grew up as an extension of our parents, Ooh. right? Of uh, a need that indirectly us showing up by maybe suppressing our emotions, maybe being the kid with no problems, never causing an issue or, or maybe being the caretaker for our parent. Habitually over time, we do that enough. We actually think that that's how we connect to other people. That's how we once kept ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. We define that as love, as a relationship. And before we know it, we continue on and seek that same pattern with our partners until, of course, we become, we become conscious. And we see, again, the role we're playing, how we're relating to others, what needs we're bringing to the table, what needs we're not bringing to the table, and, of course, make some changes. But simply... Trauma bonds come from our childhood experiences, our childhood circumstances where our only, our best solution for most of us was to adapt in some way, to meet a need, to play a role, to squash ourselves in some way, to maintain that connection because that's familiar, because that's how we need it to stay safe. Mm -hmm. We continue to repeat that even though at our core we feel disconnected, unfulfilled and unsatisfied ultimately. God, that 
it's heartbreaking, but thank you for breaking that down so eloquently. And um, I believe you also talk about emotional need entanglement. Um, talk to me about that and how that really does show up in people's lives with everything that we're talking about, about the thing that you take from younger childhood so that people right now can really start to understand themselves. And that's what I freaking love about your book is you're really trying to help people just like understand who you are, why you do the things you do, the habits, and then how we can work through them is so freaking beautiful. Um, so yeah, if you can talk to me about that. Yeah, emotional need entanglement. I mean, very much like the, the name says, it's when the emotional needs often of, of two people, it could be a whole system, get mer merged together. Now, of course, when we're in relationship with someone, it's, it's a space to honor needs, to go for support, but ultimately there needs to be a, a point of separation, of distinction between I'm me, a separate, unique individual, and you, Lisa, are you a separate, unique individual? And many of us who grew up in families who didn't have that separation or who are enmeshed is another word or codependent, we lacked that. What, what begins to happen is needs are met or entangled through another human, right? So by showing up, by keeping, say, you know, mom or dad or whomever it was in your family, you know, as happy as possible, as grounded as possible, as peaceful as possible, oftentimes by squashing our emotions in a certain moment, we become entangled. So my servicing you and your needs actually does have the byproduct of meeting my need, but it's through you in a sense. So we've entangled ourselves. We haven't created that distinction. And the reality of our emotions is that they are very individual mm. experiences. While they feel like they come from the outside world, and of course they are activated in our relationships, we do need that separation. How much of that happens in, because the, the, this may come as a shock of a question, but the reason why I'm asking is because my audience asks me a lot about narcissistic mothers. I get asked a lot now about narcissistic mothers and to really talk about that. So when you talk about this emotional needed entanglement, as you were like, I was just thinking about this, you know, that young child that has a narcissistic mother that grows up always trying to serve that need with the mother. How on earth do you start to identify, break it and separate yourself from it? Because especially when it comes to like a mother, they you hope that they're always in your lives. But when it's a narcissistic mother, there can become this tricky part of in order to distance yourself, um, doesn't that then trigger the mother? Yes. And so a simple way, you know, what I really view narcissism as is, is a, a function or a byproduct of survival mode. And we all become eye focused when we are fighting mm -hmm. for our proverbial or, you know, survival and a narcissistic parent of any kind, whether it's a mother or a father, feels so unsafe, insecure, likely again, because of their environments that they grew up in, lacking a sense of self, literally becomes survival focus. So it's not often of an ill intent that I think a lot of mm. narcissistic or people with that label, um, you know, get kind of painted as, in my opinion, it's actually a survival mode that, again, I'm gonna go maybe say something a bit controversial here that we can all slip into and do when we're in that unsafe reactive state. And I'll speak for myself. When I'm screaming and yelling at someone that I absolutely love, you better believe I'm only focused on myself, at creating safety for myself. I've actually dehumanized. I don't even see my partner, whoever I'm yelling at, as a person in that moment. And that's just a, a little example of slipping in and out. And of course, I think that those of us that are deeming our parents as like the narcissistic parent likely are always self-focused, which does mean that the emotional climate, you know, revolves around this, this human, the needs of the home, kind of everyone is servicing, making sure that that other person's needs are getting met. And usually, again, it's at the, at the consequence of, of ourself, of what we want. But I really do view narcissism as a, as a self-focused, survival-based mm -hmm. mechanism where that person is only trying to literally maintain their survival, often even at the expense of their children. And the byproduct of that for being the child of that often is we look outward and we might then continue to right, service, mm -hmm. caretake, meet the needs of everyone around us. Because at one time we had to do that to keep ourselves safe, to keep the explosions at mm -hmm. a minimum. And then we keep repeating that. And oftentimes we're left with no idea, and this is again, who I would imagine would be really helped by the workbook, who we are, 
what we need. We've lost ourselves in the service of mm. someone else. And that's what you suggest in going inwards, doing the internal work so that you can actually start to identify what are the needs that you have and then start serving yourself, like you said. Um, because that was the thing that I was thinking through as you were talking. It's like so much, and I get it. Like I'm always, I'm very honest with my parents, right? And I'm just like, I really want you to be proud of me. Like I, that's the thing. Like before you die, I want you to hear you say that you're proud of me because that is the thing that I just strive for. It makes me feel good about myself. Now, my parents have said that many times, but when I think about if you have a parent that may have some narcissistic traits, I know that a lot of people would be like, we just pigeonhole everyone now as a narcissist. <laughs> so I actually understand that not everyone's a narcissist. If you have traits, if you will, um, you, I'm just going to, again, presume that people are like me that want to have their parents proud of them or want them to be you know, happy. When you have a parent like what you just said, where it's like they're doing the best they can sometimes, they're just in like that, that scarcity, that, that fearful mode. Mm. How do you start to disconnect that? Like because you so, like do you have to actually give up the notion that your parents are ever going to be proud of you, that they're ever going to be satisfied, they're ever going to give you the pat on the back and now you just have to do the internal work? Like do you have to actually completely disconnect from that? I think it's natural. I think most of us, you know, we want pride from our loved ones we want to know or have the idea that we matter at mm. minimum right to these to these loved ones so i think it's it's really natural to have especially when it's our parents that we're talking about to to have that inner desire so we can hold space you know for that wanting that we have and also maybe hold space for the reality because now the very difficult honest conversation around what power we have to change another applies which is very limited mm -hmm. right so we can wish our parents who offer us those validation or those moments of pride or even moments of connection or even just seeing us because i think that's often what happens we don't feel seen for who we are especially when we have a narcissistic parent that actually can't shift out of their own focus to see you know us for themselves ultimately and so holding space for then the reality and knowing that we might not get that validation mm -hmm. from someone and then giving ourselves perhaps the opportunity to give it to ourselves and a prime example and while it's a bit different than validation i i love having the idea or having the feeling that i'm considered all of this comes back to childhood where i felt very limited moments of being considered unless i was performing you know i and having that moment of like having someone you know see me do something acknowledge me is something that i deeply deeply want mm. i now know my pattern enough and know that when that desire is really active for me it's an invitation of course maybe to outwardly ask for my need directly to be met for that active consideration of validation from a partner a loved one a parent whoever it is and in the occasion where that human can't or won't provide that for me for whatever multitude of reasons why someone might not be able to or choose to show up for me in that moment, I now have the opportunity to know that that's a marker that I can, an invitation for me mm. to provide that to myself. Because again, going back to the normal humanness of these needs, I think a lot of us are like, well, just squash it down. I shouldn't need validation for me. I shouldn't need to be considered. In reality, I've learned that when I'm feeling that actively, I do actually need to be considered. It just might not come or that person that I want it from might not be available, but I'm available. So I use that now as a moment or an opportunity for me to ask myself, well, okay, Nicole, if you're so desperate for consideration, is it possible that you're feeling mm. like last on your priority list? Are you not maybe showing up for yourself? Yes, ideally, maybe you want your loved one, your parent, whoever it is, to offer you that validation, that consideration. And if they're not available, can I gift myself with that? So I'm always thinking, how do you set yourself up for success? Because in those moments, you, you just, sometimes you get emotional, right? Where it's like, it's hard to go from, oh, hey, baby, and then they dismiss you to you go, to, okay, well, I'm just going to go fit in myself. Like in that moment, you just feel freaking dismissed. And so how do you go to then, all right, 
right now, I'm feeling dismissed, right? Like in real time, how do you process that? And do you have like a cheat sheet or something that you can go to? It's like, I feel dismissed, crap, what am I gonna do? Go for a walk, got it. <laughs> I'm laughing because in reality, my moments of aha realization usually occur after I've thrown a temper tantrum, I've asked someone to come hug me, but held my arm up, my dagger's out, and don't let them near me, and so, Moments of clarity for me still aren't in real time, yeah. but giving ourselves the space, the awareness to dive deeper can be the beginning of the journey. Um, I so. love that you said that because that is so important. I really need people to really freaking hear that because here you are, you've done the work, right? You've written amazing books. You you know, you live your life in this space. And yet even you saying, mm -hmm. look, it's still freaking hard. I have to do it after. It's so enlightening. I really hope people hear that. Guys, guys, honestly, hear the words that came out of my mouth. Don't seek perfection. Hear that you can learn it, hear that you can evolve. Yeah. I am so sorry. Mm -hmm. I just had to say that. Thank you for being that honest. Yeah, I mean, and that's the reality, especially when we're talking about these core reactive spaces. Mm -hmm. Those will be the last to change. It's a gift to give yourself that post play where you're able to <laughs> dive in, right? Because that's where it will begin. You know, ideally, we learn to be more conscious and to make those different choices in real time. Mm -hmm. Though, again, the reality of it is this is wired into our neurobiology quite literally my body is already beginning to activate me and i'm already interpreting and all my systems and juices are off to the races before <laughs> i even catch on to oh my gosh and again that speaks to the point of the more consistently conscious we are the more we can make different choices before we lose that control right. so for me it even includes like day to day, right? When I go through periods like this, especially I'm promoting this workbook. So I'm, you know, I'm traveling, I'm not sleeping as well. That means that my re resources are generally lower. It's gonna make it harder in those moments then to catch myself. Ooh. When I'm firing on all cylinders, I'm, you know, taking care of my body, I'm getting the sleep I need, I'm getting the movement I need, I'm getting the nutrients I need, I'm breathing calmly and deeply all the time. Then those are the moments where I might be more likely in real time to notice as my stress gets amplified, because that's usually what we're noticing first. Notice as my heart rate and I start to tense, as I'm starting to create, you know, and send myself down that old path and then make a new choice then. We try, we attempt to notice when we're already so knee deep, locked and loaded and emotionally reactive that we're, we're not setting ourselves up to succeed or we're not doing anything to care for our body outside of those moments and then expecting, you know, some breath work to work mm -hmm. or this conversation to come to top of mind the next time you're getting ready to scream and you to remember to do what Dr. Nicole said. And that's just so unrealistic that we need to set ourselves up to succeed consistently, which means creating that consistent relationship where I can notice I'm depleted, I'm stressed out. So when I now go home and return to my partners, right, after a trip like this, I might not have that bandwidth. I might need to go and take care of myself and ground myself and get some rest, or I might find myself reactive in those moments. Oh my God, this is so good. Like the reason why this is so like amazing, and what you're saying is it's this predictability. It's know thyself, don't <laughs> judge thyself, right? <laughs> yes. So it's like, oh, I know myself well enough to know that when I travel, I'm going to get less sleep. When I get less sleep, I'm more irritable. When I'm more irritable, something's mm. going to trigger me quicker, right? And just now, when you're about to book a trip, then you know <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, like being aware of mm -hmm. I'm going to be more susceptible now to being triggered. I'm going to be more susceptible now to feeling a certain way, to feeling dismissed. And so at least almost just warning yourself is a beautiful thing to do. And I love that so much. And I also like liken this to like knowing our cycles, knowing our hormones, mm -hmm. right? Because exactly what you're saying, if we can lose our shit because we're hangry, right? Because we're just like, we're, we're so hungry that we get angry. Now think about what, how we show up, if our hormones, if it's the beginning of our cycle versus the end of our cycle, if we've had the stacking effect of not eating, not sleeping, traveling, maybe having a bad experience, something's failed, and now imagine someone comes to you and even remotely like skates around your triggers, you're gonna be way more likely to have that eruption. Right, and, and the reality, and again, why the workbook even begins with those, those body type mm. habits is so few of us are, are caring for our body for many, for many different reasons. We don't even think we need to, or that's part of this conversation around emotions. Before we mm. even go into the you know, part two around the whole emotional world, it's again, understanding that we do, we do have a body and that is 
very much something that we need to care for. And I'm speaking for myself who sleep was never a priority. I was eating inflammatory foods all of the time, you know, for me. And so my whole resting mm -hmm. state was a state of depletion. So everything I was doing going about my day, I was living in that cycle of reactivity. I actually had no chance to be calm, to be grounded, to make new choices, to be in alignment because none of my resources were ever met, unbeknownst to me, because half of this information, I didn't even know that it was important to have, you know, take care of my body. I didn't realize the role that our gut plays. I didn't realize the role that our nervous system plays, which is again, why with my first book, I was so passionate about getting that information mm. out there so that we, we can know, and then we can start to not only make those choices to set ourselves up to succeed, but to give ourselves the grace mm -hmm. in those moments because some things are outside. When, the, you know, when we're going through moon cycles, when we're going through our cycles, right? I notice very much shifts and changes along with that too in terms of my sleep and my overall stress-based resources. And that will then lead to more moments of reactivity. Mm, mm. Where do body beliefs lie in everything that we're talking about now, about getting yourself grounded? Yeah, so the, what we think about our body is so much as well grounded in the experiences that we had, how were bodies modeled in our homes, right? Were bodies a, a comfortable part of day-to-day -day existence? Did we see caregivers who tended and cared for their body? Did we see maybe the quite opposite? Bodies weren't even talked about. I know for me, there was never nudity in my home. There was never conversation around body or, or, or changes like in the human development. Mm -hmm. None of that was discussed with me. It was as if we were all walking around afraid of a body becoming ill that was very present, but we never actually talked about tending to a body. So how we care for our body is gonna impact what we think of it. Also how we hear other people talking about our body, about their bodies. They might give us the best advice to care for our body, but maybe we have a caregiver who's so shaming of their own body, always on a diet, always self-critical, always trying to modify it in some way. They might be praising our body, but again, we're going to be impacted by the shame that we see reflected in how they're caring for their bodies. So what we think about our body um, is very much grounded often in the experiences that we had around bodies in general, our body in general, and then it goes to inform how we care for our body growing up. If I've learned, it's not surprising that, like I just shared with you, I didn't care for my body at all. I, I wasn't taught to. I was taught that a body only gets sick. I wasn't taught how to care for wellness in a body. So it's not surprising that I was entering my 30s and I had very limited care for my body. I had a lot of shame around my body. Again, not seeing a body being honored, being appreciated, seeing very much criticism around dieting. I saw my mom and my sister diet. I saw very negative comments. My mom made comments to me when she would see my weight fluctuating. So not only was I disconnected from my body, I didn't think very favorable about it at all. I'm actually quite shameful. And all of this came from how I saw bodies related, tended to, and how I experienced my own body in relationship with those around me. Wow, how old were you when your mom did that? My entire life, my, my mom very much based in her own, you know, conditioning. I'm sure what she saw from her mother was always, always commenting. Interestingly enough, it was very confusing because while she would so quickly, you know, assess when I've, you know, gained weight or whatever it might be and comment on that, she would just as quickly then too comment on not taking seconds at dinner because she very much learned one of the main ways my mom connected in absence of connecting emotionally with us or children was by providing, always having the dinner on the table, providing food, baking my favorite cupcakes. So very confusing. And I think this really illustrates some of the messaging Whoa, we get, right? Yeah. Watch your body, but eat to love me at the same time. And then all of this got mixed up, confused in terms of I still see moments not only where I'm shameful of my body, but where I reward my body, myself, my achievements with food, very much like my mom, or I tried to connect with other people around, of course, culturally, I think that's a different conversation in terms of connecting. But in my family, it was the only point of connection. Wow. Um, and how did that impact your self esteem? Oh my gosh, I mean, our, again, our bodies, if, even if we're minimizing and distracting ourselves from the fact that we have them, I mean, they're, they're part of ourselves, wow. right? They're our reflection outward. We adorn them with clothes, right? So how we feel in our skin very much does translate to how we feel about our self, mm. at least our physical self in general. Sometimes it washes over our entire self. So 
while I very much felt good when I was performing and achieving, you know, at my core, there's a, a lot of shame, a lot of feelings of unworthiness. And a lot of it did factor in, in terms of how my, I felt about the vessel that mm. I'm living in with. I mean, I avoid it. Uh, something I'll share really quickly because it has to do with the body. Um, growing up, I was in all different types of activities, athletics, artistic pursuits, dance here, or there, everywhere. And I have a specific memory because all I wanted to do was dance as a kid. I was really interested in dancing. I wanted to be a jazz dancer in oh particular. Oh my God, did you really? Yes. I had no idea. So to a take jazz to, dancer. To jazz dancer. I think probably it would have morphed into hip hop because now I'm there like, I feel is. that. Oh my but God. At my, at my, at the neighborhood dance studio, it was jazz, tap, and ballet offered. Long story short, to get into jazz, you had to take two years of ballet, which was not of interest to me. And I was a little girl in the back of the ballet class playing softball at the same time, very much achieving at softball. And I have a memory, you have to wear, or we wore little leotards, and I had, I had a bit of a belly. Um, I now understand that as being a lot of times when we have a lot of cortisol from stress, uh -huh. um, it can show up in particularly belly weight. But of course, when I was looking at all the other little girls around me, they were all very tiny in their little leotards. And here I was with this belly. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I probably wasn't the best at dance. I was always kind of tucked into the back. And before long, I, I started to really dislike going to dance so much so that I would complain um, and I ended up quitting dance. I stopped going to dance, I think two years in, even though I think in terms of interest and, you know, I think it really was something I probably would have pursued, but I think the self-consciousness of seeing and being in a body that not only didn't compare favorably, I was so uncomfortable in my own skin because of all of the overwhelming stressful feelings that I didn't have support intending to, I quit dance in favor of, being in a softball body where I was able to achieve, I felt better, I got better validation. So interestingly, I think for me, it, it, it had a bit of an impact even of shifting me out of possibly pursuing mm. hobbies, passions, things that were of interest to me. And of course now I'm getting back in my body and dancing around. So that for me is huge. That's so cool. I love that story mm -hmm. so much. Um, and the reason why I really love it is because everything we're talking about, it's like instead of like, stop beating ourselves up over where we are right now. Like we are an accumulation of things that have happened in our past. We can't change it. I wish we could, we can't. Until we figure out a DeLorean that we can go back in time, like, you know, Marty <laughs> yeah, McFly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so instead of beating ourselves up over it, how can we take that as information for us to then be able to hopefully today getting your book changing you know really digging into who we are so that we can then show up to have the life we want and you to sit here to say look this all stemmed from the fact that i think i was self-conscious in a leotard i realized that why i made those decisions but today that doesn't sit well with me and today i've seen why and I can change it. And I'm going to go do that dance class. Girl, I hope people freaking hear that. That is so amazing. Um, and then as you were talking, also, I thought once upon a time, I would have been like, oh, it's our ego, right? Like mm -hmm. our ego doesn't want to be bruised. But what I freaking love in your book, and literally it stopped me in my tracks. I was like, I'm going to put that on a post-it note now, not to villainize our ego. And dude, I'm do I do that all the time. It's like, ah, that bitch, you know, like <laughs> I call my ego my bitch. Um, but I love that you actually said, don't villainize it. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about why we do villainize it and then how we can actually turn it into um, a different message so that we can accept ourselves. Yeah, so I think clarity a bit on, on ego, what it is, because I think traditionally, or a lot of us, when we hear ego, we think of that kind of narcissistic, mm -hmm. right? Self-focused, mm -hmm. I'm better than thou, you know, voice or, or way of being. And really an ego, really simply, as I often simplify things is, the story of us, like who we believe our identity to be, which again, as I'm sure you're not gonna be surprised here is grounded in how we've experienced ourselves mm -hmm. and the meanings that we've made of our life and our experiences thus far. And again, grounded in our very real lived experience, we all are making meaning all of the time. If we drop in and pay attention to all the swirling thoughts in our, in our mind, we're always trying to make sense of what's happening around us. And when we're younger in that very early developmental state of dependency, something else that contributes right to this beginnings of our ego is the fact that we are developmentally immature so much that we can't understand all of the nuances and multidimensionality mm -hmm. and factors that contribute to 
anyone's decision. So when things happen in our home, to us, in our relationships, the only way that our developmentally immature mind can make sense of it is egoic or I-based. I must have been the reason that mom left, dad left, mm -hmm. that this person's not available to meet my needs, that I was abused. I must be bad, unworthy, wrong. There must be something to do with me. It gives us a bit of control. And again, it's we don't have the ability to zoom out. We don't have the maturity to be in a relationship and know all of the different factors that contribute to why we do things. Sometimes we don't even know what we do. We can only assume it's us. Dude, you just sorry to interrupt you. Holy smoke, that is like a massive aha moment. Yeah, what's we going don't on? I have, said this is so powerful, <laughs> my God. So like, Okay, so if I understand it, you're saying, hey, look, as kids, we just need meaning. Otherwise, it's just utter discomfort. We need to be grounded. So in, as a kid, you can't put all these things into mm -hmm. place. So it's actually a defense mechanism for us to say it's us. That us, that error, which comes from the Greek word me, yeah. I, uh -huh. right? So it's the ego, error, it just gives me an answer to, found, to find some grounding so that I don't feel dysregulated. But it's in that that we've now identified it's us that then leads into our adulthood that makes it think it's about us. Yeah, it gives us control too, right? Because yeah, yeah, if yeah. I can just not be bad in yeah. that way, maybe dad will come back, maybe mom will stay, maybe I won't get yelled at, screamed at, abused. Right? It gives us that semblance, too, of understanding, wow. meaning, and control. It gives us something to do about it, right? And then I, now mm -hmm. I can adapt. Mm -hmm. Now I can change myself. Right. Now oh. I can just show, right? For me, seeing a very stressed out household, there was, there was only so much that the LaPeras could take. So I, I felt that. Mm -hmm. I felt the complete overwhelm all the time. So I started to share less and less about me out of concern that it would stress the system Ooh. because that was the experience that I had, right? So I squash part of me. I assume that I'm, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back every time. So if I just limit, and then I became described in my family as shy Nicole, secretive Nicole. Nicole never tells us anything. Nothing ever bothers Nicole. All of that was so far from the truth. But if I feel like I'm causing or contributing at least to this overwhelm that's completely destabilizing me, I can just stop ca causing it. I can just bring less of me to that table. So back to ego, what then happens over time, because we love to be right, because we also then have a part of our brain that colludes with this whole process called the reticular activating system that to deal with the seemingly endless amount of stimuli that we just can't physically take in as a human being, we are always filtering and determining what is of personal relevance. And what's of personal relevance are our deep-rooted beliefs, who we think we are. We love to be right and confirm those. So before we know it outside of our awareness, we delete everything from our existence that challenges our identity. We continue to operate based on this story of who we think we are, right? So I'm nothing bothers Nicole. Chance, you know, not surprising to hear that I became perfect partner call, mm -hmm. never brought an issue, never asked for support in my relationships. I led with that same egoic way of being and I felt challenged, right, anytime I tried to operate or share anything out of that. So simply, an ego is a story of us, very much grounded in our lived experiences, often adaptations, how we think we've had to make or how we've had to make sense of our life without all of the developmental awareness that then gets repeated and filtered that we get so locked and loaded and sure of who we are into adulthood that let's bring this full circle we can become really reactive and defensive if we hear something outside of what we know to be true Dude, that's, that is <laughs> the most powerful way i've ever heard ego expressed that's amazing it's all just fit into place like every block as you were saying i was like oh my god it's making a beautiful picture now and it's it actually makes me think very differently about the ego about why we focus on our ego why it has a villainous thing right. to it and actually it's been our protector right yes that's it, it's been trying so hard to serve us to keep us in that familiar to keep us knowing ourselves in the way that we become comfortable and anything outside of that any perspective that doesn't match this is again where we can get mm -hmm. heated arguments with loved ones even very well-meaning ones who point out the shadow sides of us, the things that are harder for us to see, right? And, or when we hear people who express beliefs outside of our own beliefs, mm -hmm. we can become really reactive and squash because it, the reason being, again, going back to this, what feels like disproportionate reactions in those moments, 
actually aren't disproportionate, right? They're our safety making mechanism. We feel challenged, threatened when we're having a new experience or hearing something new about ourselves. And if I've only come to identify but with that very egoic story or who I think I am, now I'm going to be really challenged anytime I hear those alternate mm. perspectives. And I'm not gonna wanna let this new information in because then I've become unfamiliar to even myself. Now you're challenging everything that I think of and that challenge now becomes extremely uncomfortable. Yes. Now I, I, I have no option but to take it personally because what mm. I feel is happening is a very personal attack, but we have to understand. So not to villainize, it means observing it, mm. seeing these stories, seeing how we're coloring our experiences with possibly this reactivity and expanding the space to acknowledge all of the rest of us, mm. everything that maybe didn't have space or safety in our childhood to express, everything that maybe I've shut down about myself to at one point keep myself connected and safe, that's still part of us. So the goal of ego work in general is to acknowledge that I've yet to meet a human who doesn't have an ego, who's not doing some of this subconscious filtering and biasing and reacting when it's kind of outside of our familiar bounds of self to acknowledge that maybe in those moments we are feeling a bit threatened and then over time being able to expand and allowing in the rest of our being that probably has been just pushed below the surface. Mm, I love that. And you also say like, uh, like name your ego, Jessica. That's right. <laughs> I think it can be really, really helpful. Um, and that's like a silly way to play with it, but to create that separation, right? If I can, the ego isn't me. It's a part of my story. It's been a very validated part of my story that again, has kept me safely protected as the overachiever without needs because that's who I had to be. So thank you, Jessica, for your service. And I think sometimes acknowledging when that voice is active by calling it Jessica's voice can be the beginning of that separation. Jessica is part of my story, has played a protective role mm. in my story, but Jessica isn't who Nicole is. Mm -hmm. There's much more to Nicole. So I invite anyone listening to not only observe their ego, anytime we think I, you know, anytime we're having thoughts that are very much kind of about me, who I think I am, what my place is in the world, pay attention to how repetitive and habitual those stories are. That might be the voice of that ego. And if you would like to give your ego a name again, I think that can help create that separation, maybe even add a bit of humor, which I think helps on all of our journeys. Yeah. When the ego comes alive, you can acknowledge, oh, Jessica, you know. <laughs> That's what I really like about it. And obviously, you know, people have talked about like alter egos, but I've never really thought about it in this realm as a way to help yourself get over triggers, get over emotional issues, get over trauma. Like I've never really thought of, I've always thought of like, you know, alter ego, like Sasha Fierce, yes, yes, right? Yes, yes. It's like, and it's like me with my hair. It's like, yes. I don't always have my hair like this, but it's my way of showing up. But I've never thought of ego as being like that. Like when you have something that maybe stings or maybe it shows up to just say, oh, it's, it's Jessica. You know, like having that kind of like your mate where it's like, oh, it's her, but it doesn't mean that it's me. Because I think when we think of it as being, this is who I am, yes. it can like um, really like create knots. I mean, explain to me actually what that's doing to us. Yeah. I think what you're describing yeah. is, is that constriction, is mm. limitation. Right, it's kind of shrinking in. I mean, when we've defined who we are, we don't really give us any other option to have any other experience mm -hmm. of ourself. I think egos, identities, it, to some extent, largely can, can be limiting if we make that our whole story. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, and I think it's a tough reality for most of us living this human experience, is that we're, we are multidimensional. There mm -hmm. isn't just one way to kind of summarize or put in a bucket or put a hat on what I am even, right? There's so much of what I am. And I can even make a case that there's an evolution of what I am in and of myself. So when we embrace that multidimensionality, I think then we allow ourselves that space, but so few of us do that. We become constricted. We kind of even feel ourselves tense inside. Mm -hmm. um, and I could even go as far to say that some of us inhabit then the role of, and this is where we can talk about and Actually, the next book that I'm working on on relationships is gonna talk a lot about what I call conditioned selves. Mm -hmm. When this idea of ego actually morphs into this whole embodied function role I play, where I become right the caretaker in a relationship, where my whole sense of self is based on this idea of that's all I am. Mm -hmm. I'm a person who provides care. My neurobiology shifts and that's, I embody that actual self. So I can make a statement that ego right becomes the cloud that some of us can become the weather of 
and we don't then we limit ourselves that we can't even imagine stepping outside of our roles let alone our stories wow girl that's so strong you mentioned that i didn't want to interrupt you our shadow selves so how in everything that we're talking about can we identify what our shadow selves are if you actually don't mind explaining what that is um yeah, let's start there. Yes, so our shadow is all of the repressed, which means kept out of our awareness, aspects of ourselves. So if in childhood, again, we didn't have the space to be sad, be angry, maybe just self-express our creativity or just be who we are, the more consistently we got a message, direct or indirect, not to do that, mm. that those things don't go away. Emotions don't go away. That aspect of ourself doesn't go away. It might go out of our conscious awareness. And then we call that it's, repressed in our shadow if you will think mm. of like the shadow that's cast we can't see it necessarily where we do experience our shadow often is sometimes when we have this is very interesting it's funny that i brought that dance story i imagine this is why i didn't know you were going to go uh, to shadow no. but what i would notice when good old instagram came to be the dancing app as it was oh, began yeah. Can imagine where I'm going here, scrolling Instagram, seeing people dance freely, that constriction you just mm. felt, I would almost seethe inside. I would feel my body clench, and I might even think some negative, critical things about the dancer. Not, mm. oh wow, look at this beautiful dancer in full self-expression, how nice, what a thing that my little self would have wanted. So repressed, all of that, that what I saw in that freedom of self-expression, that ease in the body that at least communicates to me when I see someone dancing, all of that aspect of myself was so pushed outside of my awareness. The desire to be free and at ease in my body was projected, is what we call it, and came out as irritation, mm. negative reaction at something I see in someone else. Understanding that the shadow of it, right, was in me. Mm. I didn't see it in myself. The ability to be easeful, free, connected to one's body, I saw it in that person and I had a negative reaction. So that's a lot of times where we can see our shadow reflect it when we are turned off by certain aspects of another person is a really great place to wonder within, um, seeing if there's an aspect of ourself. Because um, I can make a case that we all have aspects of everyone right. inside of us. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, there's certain times where we're all a little bit of something mm -hmm. in different moments. So when we have though those big visceral reactions can be an indicator and it isn't always negative things that we're repressing, oh. right? Some of us might have learned to repress even our ability to shine, talents that we've mm. had. If there wasn't space or if that wasn't rewarded, maybe in the traditional sense, our parents didn't think that that was gonna get us the good paying job that they wanted. It could be some of our natural gifts and talents that we've squashed below the surface. Again, all because of the messaging that we got doesn't mean it's not in us oftentimes it's activated when we see it in someone else and usually it's unfavorable how mm. we're feeling because when it really comes down to it we don't like that part of ourself oh and so do you think that we should start i mean yes you have a workbook so i'm sure your answer is going to be yes but like starting to take inventory because as you were talking it's like how do you actually start to identify your shadow self obviously you said you know when you're starting to get that uncomfortable maybe that negative like that could be a sign is that where people should start like if someone's just starting right now and they're like oh i I don't recognize that I'm showing up like that. I actually do believe I really hate this dance and I really hate that, sh you know, the shoes that that woman's wearing or whatever. But a lot of the time there's that deep rooted thing, right? So yeah. um, what would you suggest? Yeah, would it be inventory then backtracking? What would that look like? Yeah, paying attention. I think anytime, I'm gonna answer this really globally, anytime we're having a feeling, we can get really curious and mm. begin to explore what's causing it. So whether it's the negative reaction to the Instagram post that you're seeing, mm -hmm. the negative reaction to the comment that your partner made, right? Feelings are, are, are meant to provide us information. Mm -hmm. If we can learn, right, how to in a grounded way, see them, allow them in, I should say first, and allow them to not dysregulate us so that they can be part of our experience, but not color our experience. And overwhelm us and send us back into that cycle of reactivity. But when we can, you know, negotiate life with emotions, then I think any time we have an emotion that's activated, especially a big one, can give us an opportunity mm. to then explore and then getting really honest. Okay, well, what is it? What am I reacting to? What is it about those shoes? What is my mind telling myself about the person who wears those shoes maybe? Oh, well, that's a person who would X, Y, or Z. And oh, that's something that I don't want to be. About. Oh, okay, well, 
can I see any moments where I am X, Y, or Z, or where I too act on X, Y, or Z, right? That's just a little bit of a mm -hmm. quick way of doing that backtracking, but start with any feelings. Feelings are information. The more consistently we have feelings, the bigger the feelings are, we can explore. Again, what is the meaning I'm making? What is my mind telling me about the person who's wearing or doing this thing? Mm -hmm. And if I'm really honest, can I locate a place in time where I see that in me? And can I work to allow that to be okay? That is so beautiful. And you said this earlier, but I want to repeat it because it fits so perfectly here as well, is that once you start to understand everything you're saying, once you start to practice it yourself, you can now actually see it in other people and I think have more understanding. So when someone is coming to you having this, you know, heightened reaction, if you've already done the work and you're like, oh, this may be their shadow self, what am I doing? Like I try to be as empathetic as I possibly can. And look, we're on social, so we probably open ourselves up a lot more to <laughs> than other people. But when you get pushback, hate, um, negative comments, whether it's on social or even within your own family, I try to then put on my empathetic hat. And now you're giving me words to be able to use because I normally say, oh, I've probably triggered them. How did I trigger them? Like, I kind of just go to that because I'm like, what? <laughs> because I wore my hair like this all of a sudden they're freaking out. Like, what the hell did I, you know, do? And so I go, okay, it's a trigger. But now being able to use the shadow self is actually a really beautiful language to be able to say, like, what is in their shadow self? And maybe they've squished that I'm triggering that to now rear its head. Yeah. What you're describing really beautifully, Lisa, is what I call it depersonalizing, right? Learning to pull back and have that inquiry and see, you know, the moments where it could be about us. And this is where I say, you know, mm. having that nuance, that discretion, you know, maybe not believing strangers on the internet who never met you, but maybe do listening to those close loved ones that you know have your best interest and might offer you that vantage point that we were talking about earlier. And in the moments, again, where it is a heightened reaction, it is a reaction or someone's making an assessment about you that they couldn't possibly know to be true because they don't know you, then you could kind of pull back and understand things and explore things from that vantage point, from a less personal. Yeah, they're saying and reacting to my words, my appearance, my way of being or whatever it is, but for them, it's coming from a deeper place. I don't even have to invalidate, mm. nor would I want to. Their feeling is very real. They're having a very real emotional reaction, though it might not be to me in particular, right? Just like I project similar, like we've been mm -hmm. talking about this whole conversation, right? There might be a similarity or a meaning that they've made over what they think they see or how they're perceiving or subjectively hearing what I'm saying or, or subjectively seeing how I'm presenting that again is very similar to something that they've lived, not invalidating what their feelings mm -hmm. and of course creating boundaries so I can safely allow them to have their feeling while I'm safely over here. But that's essentially the process of depersonalizing. I can understand it from a less personal perspective than I was able to in childhood. Yeah, I love that. Um, dude, as you were talking, I was like, all right, let's just go masterclass on this interview right now. So everything you're saying, once we do the work, you even said like when there are people around you that you can really trust, that's obviously very important to feel safe around you for someone to be able to maybe help you through things or point something out. What the hell do you do if there's someone that you very much trust, they've proven time and time again that they absolutely have your back, that they love you more than life itself, that they want good things for you, but their advice and feedback is all coming from their shadow self. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, in terms of understanding, of course, the more we know about someone, right, the more than we could have even like the statement, oh, I can see where this is ultimately coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have choice, we can hear, we can listen. Ultimately, what we do on someone's feedback, on someone's perception, on someone's perspective is up to us. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanna emphasize this because most of us as humans, all of us as humans, we want to be heard. We want our perspective to be taken into consideration. We want to know we matter. We want to know that, you know, if we are sharing our perspective, even if it's coming from our shadow self with mm -hmm. a loved one, that it's not landing on deaf ears or being argued. So there's a way I believe to, to sensitively hear and listen, though ultimately we, it is our choice what we do with the information. So then having that moment where we can hear and graciously thank someone for their feedback, their perspective, you know, we may not be able to convince them where it is coming from, even if we do have that vantage point of coming from the shadow, because ultimately we, we can offer it, 
it's up to them to choose it. So just as much as they can, we can hear their feedback, we then go and take, I kind of have a visual feedback from anywhere that we can receive it from, from someone's shadow, well-meaning or not, and decide for ourselves. And I, I believe that needs to be part of, of the discretion, the developing of discretion journey of humans is to have that moment in time. Have that listen, not argue, not even try to convince someone that it's coming from our shadow because if they're not willing to hear it, they're not going to be open to us being blue in the face, screaming and yelling or arguing it so we can receive that information. Thank you for sharing your perspective. And then we could take that to our home base. Mm -hmm. We can then go observe ourselves and see if we see from their perspective what they mean. And ultimately we get to choose because it might not be for us. It might not be about us. It might never have been. And then we can have that choice. They feel heard we feel empowered to continue on in the way that we know aligns with us. Oh, I love that so much. And how much then, because you talk about heart consciousness, which I love, I'd never heard that before. So talk to me about heart consciousness and how this also plays in relationships when you have these moments where you have to go in and really listen to yourself and not necessarily take your partner or a friend's thoughts and advice as fact. Yeah, so our heart is, we are now finding out very scientifically how incredibly powerful our heart is. I mean, there's so much about the human body from the shoulders down that mm. is so incredibly powerful and so full of wisdom from, from our gut, where we have those gut instincts to, to our heart. We now know that our heart actually submits an electromagnetic field that's even more powerful than our brain. It's usually measured in how many feet away you can kind of feel the vibration or the frequency of our heart or our brain um, producing. And our heart, I think it's somewhere around six feet around wow. us can influence. So if there was electrodes, say, in a, in a glass of water, yeah. my heartbeat would be able to, if it's within that, within that six feet, I mean, don't quote me, I could be wrong on the exact numbers, but I think it's Still, around though. six feet of our body, you would pick up my heart frequency more so than my brain frequency in that in that glass of water. So. Our heart is not only communicating signals to the external environment, it's communicating signals to our brain. Our heart actually plays a big role in coordinating activity. We used to give our brain all of the credit. <laughs> our brain was everything. And our brain is very, very powerful. But again, so is our gut and so is our heart. Yeah. And just as much as our brain is sending information down, our heart is sending so mm. much coordination of not only physiological but emotional messaging up to our brain. So as far as I'm concerned, our heart is the location of that intuition, that essence, right? That kind of indescribable sensation or compass mm. or guidance system that we're all looking for. And because so few of us are paying actually attention to our heart, not only again, is it our interface for our environment, giving us information about how we're experiencing it. In my opinion, like I said, it is really a vessel of what makes us us? I mean, I've read, read fascinating stories of, I don't know if you've gone down the rabbit hole of any heart transplant or no. there's incredible stories of heart transplant stories where hearts of you know individuals who have passed get obviously implanted into a living individual. And to the surprise, I think, of everyone involved, not only memories, taste, wow. preferences begin to become evident with this idea that our heart actually has like memories that's stored in it. So. Our heart is incredibly fascinating. Again, very few of us, I think, for the point of this conversation, we're not connected to our heart. Or if we are, if we have those, again, instincts, sensations, because our heart doesn't speak in our thinking mind, in the repetitive stories, it's sensations. It's kind of, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, um, little indications, aha, light bulbs, kind of things that seemingly plop into our, you know, conscious awareness seemingly out of nowhere. All of that is more of the language, it's body-based is the point I'm trying to make of our intuition. And if we're paying attention to our mind, if we're not even attuned to our heart, or if we are and we feel like we know what our heart wants, but we override it oh, based on what yeah, we think we yeah, should do yeah, or what yeah, we were taught yeah. to do or a million other reasons we convince ourselves out of doing those things. <laughs> And I'm of the belief that the more, again, we drop into our body, the more we learn how to reintegrate or connect, reconnect with our heart and then attune to its messages. Because again, it's much more on a sensory system. We have to learn to hear, even the way you describe, I feel that mm. kind of constriction, right? That's coming from somewhere deeper within. So learning to pay attention to those signals will, in my opinion, give us that guidance that we're looking for, giving us the moments of saying, well, wait a minute, what do I 
what does my heart say about this? What does my heart want to do? And the more, of course, we can align our actions with that heart space, the more that we're allowing our intuition to guide us. That's amazing, but what about the, the so, you know, like in relationships, so many people just like, oh, well, don't just follow your heart. Like, you, you know, your heart's gonna lead you astray because it's like, it wants something. So maybe, you know, the messaging that I've heard is your heart so wants to, let's say, be with somebody that it will be blind to certain things. People blame the heart for that. Do you, um, do you agree with that? I would question whether or not they're following their heart or their familiar oh, relationship yeah. pattern in those moments, right? Because I think to really attune to our heart, it's, it's, it's again, learning how to, how to drop in. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of times what we're attracted to in relationships or what we think we're gravitating toward or is coming again from that instinctive place mm -hmm. is more maybe coming from the familiarity of that dynamic than from the deeper heart space. So when people would say, let's say, or you know, the phrase, it's a broken heart, do you feel like it is actually the heart that's broken or that it's our perception of what this means about us, let's say stemming from a child where when we were dismissed or someone's left me, my heart breaks, but really makes me feel yes. like I'm no good, I'm not worthy. Yes. And that produces a feeling in our heart too. So it's both mm, and. Mm. Um, again, our heart is very much a conductor of our emotions. Our heart goes in and out of what's called coherence based on the emotion we're feeling. When we're feeling compassion, when we're feeling connection, when we're feeling love, it's described as we're in heart coherence. The rhythm of our heart actually changes when we're feeling anger, when we're feeling hurt, when we're feeling sadness. We actually did a podcast episode, Jenna and I, on heartbreak and how very much it's in the body and it does map onto pain and a shift in our heart's rhythm. So it's and. Mm -hmm. It's what happened in childhood, maybe it's similarity or lack thereof in what's happening now, it's still very real, producing very real feelings, which we can actually feel sometimes in our physical heart space where it does feel like it's breaking and it maps onto mm -hmm. a physiological change in rhythm in terms of coherence versus incoherence. That's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Oh I'm God. fascinated by the heart. That's incredible. And you know, even in the book where you take people through, you know, like put your hand on your heart, take these deep breaths. So as I, I was listening to on Audible, but like as I was doing it, I was putting my hand on my heart. You were coaching me through it. And as I was doing it, I was like, I don't remember the last time I put my hand on my heart. Yeah. I don't know the last time that I thought about my heart. Right. And as you were talking also, the, uh, the time that most recently sticks with me is when my puppy passed away, my dog, you know, he was 17, such a, it was Tom and I's baby. And I remember when he died, all I could do was put my hand on my heart and go, my heart's broken. I was like, my heart hurts. And I just kept repeating to Tom, like my heart hurts. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm getting all emotional, yeah. well. And I don't remember the last time I ever felt like my heart hurt. And it was like I was like putting my hand on my heart and just like trying to protect it. I've never done that before. Yeah, I have memories in childhood. Um, one of the most visceral memories I have is laying in bed at night and it would usually come around a recurring nightmare that I would have. And I would wake up from this nightmare and the pressure, it would feel like someone was putting their hand straight through my heart space. And I never had language and knew what it was. And obviously now looking back, I believe it was a, a broken heart of, of not having, for me, that, that connection with really anyone in my family feeling so, so deeply alone and that, that I remember very viscerally in childhood. I can almost call to mind what it was to feel that and it was in my heart space. And then as I grew, interestingly, my posture even, mm. for a very long time, my mom would be like, stand up straight, don't you like being tall? And, you know, I would roll my eyes at her as, you know, oftentimes an adolescent, a teenager does, like, oh, mom, you yeah. know. And again, I now view it through the lens of I was protecting this whole kind of hunched posture, at least the sense I've made of it, was coming from quite literally a broken heart of no fault of my mom or my family's mm, own, of their sure. inability of themselves to even be connected to themselves, let alone me, of a broken heart. And then my whole postural, right, protection that then translated to this distance in relationships, never acting like I had feelings because I was never gonna let my heart be broken again. And it was then again, that visceral feeling in the heart that I can even recollect now of like, <gasps> almost like takes my breath away feeling. Oh my God, you're tapping into something so strong right now. Um, 
I love learning new things. I love evolving. And so when it comes to our lives, how we show up, how we feel about ourselves, how we show up in other relationships, you know, we've spoken so much, you know, me and you have spoken about trauma in the past, you know, in other interviews, when we talk about the mind, we talk about the gut, talking about the mind-gut connection. But this new piece that you've just introduced to my life, girl, is really powerful. Um, and so I'm just going to like really sit with it. Like, I don't even know why I got all emotional. Like, it's a, and even this, I don't ever judge myself. I come like, oh, why am I getting emotional? What is this new thing? Mm -hmm. Maybe you are tapping into this new thing of way of thinking, which now is unlocking more in my life and in other people's lives. And, you know, I think of this thing as being information that now I can use to think through past issues, think through issues that I'm going through. So thank you so much for, like, introducing this to my life as well as like you know in of the book course. about heart consciousness yeah absolutely so you'll meet the heart in the the third section which i strategically put at the end right mm -hmm. once we are safe in our bodies to attune to the emotions we can explore our ego our shadow self and then peel back all those layers and then you know we do meet kind of attuning to the heart in terms of our authentic self click here right now guys to learn the three boundaries every woman must set in a relationship other people don't need to understand or agree with your boundary in order to respect it. She may make you try to feel bad for setting the boundary and being the difficult one, but that is just...